Hello everyone, this is Mia Dan and welcome to the evening session of Women in AI Ethics. I'm Mia Dan, I am the CEO of Lighthouse 3. I'm also the founder and creator of the Women in AI Ethics Initiative and the 100 Brilliant Women in AI Ethics list. We are so excited to have you all today. If you had joined us for the morning session, some of what I'm sharing might be slightly redundant, but um, I just wanted to make sure anyone who's joining us um, right now for the first time has um, some context for the work that we are doing and how you could be involved and together how we can make progress on ethics and diversity. So uh, I'm based in California and just last week, uh, we uh, starting last week, we had a lot of uh, wildfires in the Bay Area and about a million acres were scorched uh, within a matter of days. And I fast forward to this morning, it was cloudy, it was raining, it was cold. So I don't know what bigger sign we need to know that climate, uh, climate change is a real crisis and we really need to deal with it. But wherever you are in the world, wherever you're joining us from, I do hope you're staying safe, you're staying healthy, uh, because uh, these are very challenging times. And I'm so grateful for all of you to, for joining us uh, for this session, uh, because we will be uh, able to talk to some amazing women today who will help us, uh, give us some hope <laughs> for the future. So I'll share my journey uh, from Mumbai to Silicon Valley. I am an immigrant from India. I love uh, highlighting Desi pop artist, Maria Kamar's work. She's an Indo-Canadian and she just does amazing artwork to support her. I, she's a major feminist, um, someone uh, we should all be uh, looking up to and supporting. So, um, I grew up in a very uh, poor traditional family. We often talk about casteism, we talk about colorism. Uh, I, I like to uh, talk about classism and the role that privilege plays. Uh, I had a double whammy. I was a woman who was born in a very poor family. So my parents didn't have a lot of ambition for me. I just had two, like three, one goal, it was to get married, uh, be a homemaker, birth an heir and a spare. And I, I swear it's not a joke. I'm not kidding. Um, and as a woman, uh, especially growing up in that background, you're pretty much invisible. So I'll tell you how I did, right? This is the metrics, success metrics my parents have for me. Uh, I got married, but I didn't stay married. Uh, uh, I, um, I love to cook, but I'm not a homemaker. I am a career woman. I like to... Uh, I do more than just uh, take care of the home. Uh, I uh, have a child and my child came out as a transgender uh, non-binary a few years back. So uh, my parents, my family might say I'm a failure, but I think I've done pretty, if you ask my kid, I think I did pretty good. So um, I landed in Silicon Valley. Yes, I'm one of those folks who had an arranged marriage obviously. Uh, I worked at many uh, tech companies and throughout I've always been told like the first thing they tell you move fast, break things. And my first manager said, may I just ask for permission later? And things get too stressful. I was always told chill, we're not saving babies. So this is a point where my mom had just passed away. My child is at high risk for uh, self-harm. And I'm thinking, why aren't we saving babies? We are the big. We have, we are the most talent in Silicon Valley. We uh, we hire all these great people. Why on earth are we saving lives? So that started my disillusionment with um, Valley. I left. I started my own company. I continue doing the same work that I'm doing. Uh, I was doing uh, inside of a corporation. I help companies adopt technologies like artificial intelligence and others, but do it in a more responsible way. Uh, I've always uh, I've hosted events in the Bay Area for over ten years now. And, uh, and we've always had a very diversity first approach. So 80 to 90% of all my speakers are always women or people of color. And the goal is very simple. Let's increase and expand access to technologies for everyone, because I don't believe technology is something that should just be for the privilege. We should all have access to it. Um, so another, another uh, the two years back, uh, my dad passed away. So. Uh, I was devastated. My dad was the special person who didn't have a lot of money, but the house was always open. There was always food. There were families, there were strangers. And that's something, uh, that's his legacy. I also try and keep an open heart. And uh, if you ever come to my place, there always be lots of samosas. Uh, but this was a time when um, I was devastated. Oh, you know what every grieving person does. I open a bottle of wine and I'm drinking and I'm just like, I'm on Twitter. 
And I noticed folks were talking about uh, a list I'd published, 12 brilliant women's list. And I found that uh, some folks thought it was biased. It was just 12 women, granted. So I started researching and long after the wine had run out, I, uh, I got to, I researched research, I found 100 women and I published, published that list. And uh, we had this matter, we had a lot of support and this was at Microsoft last year, you'll recognize Rose, uh, uh, who spoke at that event around, <laughs> along with Mira Lane. It was a fantastic event and we knew, we, we were onto something, we had to keep this going. Uh, but one thing that comes up over and over again, and we've noticed that people talk about ethics and diversity as these are these two different things, right? These are the people doing ethics of AI and diversity is this other group that, that does diversity and they don't necessarily intersect. So we wanted to change that because we do believe that they both are interconnected, they're related. And believe me, this is not a pipeline issue when people have a all white panel or all male panel, it's, it's because they haven't looked. Because there are amazing women out there, we have to make sure that they're recognized, represented. We have 415 women in our directory today. Uh, yes, the, the list is now a directory and 16 regions represented and we have barely getting, we've barely gotten started. This shouldn't come as a surprise. You've seen the headlines and all the women on here, you know, uh, women are bearing the brunt of this crisis, right? E even uh, in your thing, in COVID-19, we are the experts, women, uh, are the experts in epidemiology, medicine, and yet men get quoted more. So it's because the way we think about expert, right? It's all about definition. How do we define expert? How do we define success? We look at the men and we say, okay, this is what we think as successful. I mean, they see a woman, a woman of color, it just doesn't compute. So we need to change that because what's it's doing is impacting um, even the folks who go to school there, because it's not just enough to open the door, you also have to make the folks feel included. And that's actually a picture I took at Oxford last year. It was an all white panel talking about domestic violence data. Imagine that. So I called them out on that because I, 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 I asked a serious question. I said, do you feel qualified to talk about an issue that impacts women more? So that's where we, uh, Ended, but look at the context, right? Fast forward to today. Uh, anyone who thinks Black Lives Matter is politics is kidding themselves and they're just uh, not acknowledging the fact that it is not politics. This has been happening for a long time. It's about time that we all stepped up and realized this is an issue. These are human lives being lost, uh, promising human lives lost to uh, institutional violence. Uh, there is this myth that we think about um, meritocracy and I just want to bust that right now because there are two systems if you're privileged enough uh, to get into uh, to be born into privilege it's a smooth path it's a very easy path uh, I want to share an example on the left that you have on the screen on left is Tanya McDowell she tried uh, for a good life for her child tried to get her six-year-old enrolled in a public school outside of a zip code she got a five-year sentence Lauren Blacklin, uh, Aunt Becky, uh, whom we all have come to know over the years, uh, got two months for bribing prestigious universities for her daughter. Uh, and granted, there is uh, some talent involved, but it helps to come from privilege. And we should really call it, call it what it is. We need to call that there are two systems and folks who don't have privilege are not born into it, don't have the same opportunities. And of course, don't say it on Twitter because there'll always be all these folks who will attack you for saying that. So. Well, let's look at the future of AI. Uh, and I just want to make sure that I am not, yeah, I have five minutes. Um, it's, the future of AI seems to be just like, it seems to be going to the highest bidder. Because if you look at, if you have a problem with administration today, and there are a lot of crit valid criticism that we hear, but how do you then align that with the fact that the money that's flowing the administration that you say is unethical are the, is the same money that's flowing to our universities? So who exactly is shaping the conversation around ethics? When the people who are funding all of these initiatives are not really known for ethics, right? So something to think about. Uh, I, I would love to tell you the system is broken, it's flawed, and 
the bad news is it was built this way. Uh, if you think about what's happening right here in California, um, Tesla's factory was forced to keep open, stay open uh, and the workers were forced to come in despite the held order. Uh, Amazon, the workers, right? Um, we tout how much, what the, how great the technology, how great AI is, autonomy is everything, autonomy systems are everything, but what happens to the worker who has to work next to that robot? Uh, we are dehumanizing workers and humans, and we are not even like, it's being normalized. So let's talk about researchers um, who are actually working on this space. Um, but sorry, it, the researchers are working on issues which are not necessarily real world either, and therein lies the, lies the problem. When the world is starving and you're looking for the coolest next project to do, there's definitely a disconnect that needs to be addressed. So I'll, I would like to conclude with just uh, this one thing about uh, Instagram. Um, We've seen all the black squares. We hear a lot of eloquent speeches from universities who are saying, hey, Black Lives Matter, this is so important. But then at the same time, they're not funding any, the, the first things to be cut are the race studies, the minority studies, the first faculty to be um, eliminated tends to be uh, the people of color. So again, there's this disconnect. We think of diversity as being this tired old phrase. People are trying to come up with a new word. Oh, we shouldn't be using diversity. Maybe it's not the term itself, but the way it's being used, that might be the problem. So why are we here today? We're here today because we are unreasonable women and allies. We believe that the world could be a better place. And it is up to all of us to work together, to come together to change. And well, when we started this and um, put together the directory, I, uh, we expanded the uh, scope. We said, it's not just about algorithmic bias. It should be about human rights, the impact on society, on workers. It should be uh, who, not just whether a system ethically developed, is it ethically used? And then last year, we also, um, earlier this, uh, during COVID-19, we decided to add a diversity element. So every woman who works for Women in AI Collective, Ethics Collective, who's part of that, is, um, is, is uh, signing up. Is signing up not just representing that group, but also being a vocal advocate for it. So what have we done so far? Uh, other than the directory, we have a ton of programs that if you have um, attended the morning sessions, we have mentoring, we have Wikipedia representation, we do book chats, we had a book chat with Marielle Gray, who also is at Microsoft. Uh, pleasant coincidence there on uh, Twitter chats. And we want to continue doing these unconferences so we can all come together and solve these problems together. Uh, women and AI Ethics Collective, amazing women are helping us uh, change the world, make it a better place. Uh, so. Finally, what is our mission? Our mission is to make sure women are heard. You want to, we want to make sure women are being seen, they're being heard, they feel supported, they feel empowered to tell their own stories. No more of privileged people telling the stories of marginalized groups. We give a platform to minorities, marginalized groups, and our ultimate goal is to make sure that everyone, no matter what your background is, where you come from, you all have, we all have access to opportunities. So that was it, and um, I'm channeling Alice Walker right now. I do firmly believe that the most common way we give up power is by thinking we don't have any. Um, big shout out to all our volunteers. They've been on for 12 hours uh, and behind the scene rock stars. So thank you all so much for all that you do. And we will be sending out a survey after this event, uh, but I will pause now and we will go to our panel discussion. All right. Hi everyone, it's me again. And this time I am joined by three amazing panelists. Uh, I'll make brief introductions and I'll turn it over to them to introduce themselves as well. So let's start with left to right. We have Arthi, uh, Dr. Arthi Setu Madhavan, who is the head of user research and AI, ethics and society at Microsoft Cloud and AI. Um, then we have Rose Margaret Ekin Etua, apologies if I mispronounced it, uh, 
one of these days I'm going to get it right, Rose, I promise. Uh, so Dr. Rose is Professor of Engineering, Ohlone uh, College, right here in California in the Bay Area. Um, we have uh, then K. I I just want to make sure I have K as well. Uh, K. for Butterfield as well who is uh, with the World Economic Forum and she does, uh, she's the head of the fourth industrial, um, she's the head of AI and machine learning and she's also a member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum. Amazing folks have joined us today. So let me just hand it over to you all to introduce yourself. Please tell us how you got started in your current role. I can go first. <laughs> Thanks, Mia. Thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Uh, how did I get started in my role? So I have to rewind a few years back. So I, I grew up in India and uh, I finished my undergrad in computer science. And then I moved to the US for grad school. So I was pursuing my PhD in human factors and ergonomics. And uh, during my graduate school life, uh, I was uh, looking at the impacts of automated systems on the performance of air traffic controllers, you know? So really the concepts that we hear a lot today, which is, you know, trust in automation, system reliability, meaningful human control, you know, all of those ethics terms that we hear today. So I, I think that that was my first introduction to responsible innovation or responsible product development, though those phrases were not in my head at that time. And then I graduated and I worked in healthcare for the longest time. I worked uh, for a company called Medtronic. It's one of the largest med device manufacturers in the cardiac rhythm heart failure business. And uh, there again, I got exposure to another safety critical industry, which is healthcare. And, uh, you know, to get regulatory approval, you got to demonstrate that your products are safe and effective, right, for your end users. And how do you do that? You combine a lot of analytical approaches. Uh, you combine that with empirical approaches like qualitative and quantitative research studies. Um, so as to make your product safe and, make, and ensure that the residual risk is as small as possible. So fast forward to today, I am on this uh, really uh, unconventional team called Ethics in Society. We, we sit uh, in an engineering organization within the Microsoft's cloud and AI business. And within uh, that uh, team, I lead the discipline of user research. So there's no ethics in society without society, right? So on the team, my role is really to bring uh, the voices of the diverse members of the community, especially those of vulnerable groups, you know, just like you said, Mia, uh, into product development. And, and we work on all sorts of emerging tech like face recognition and synthetic voice, mixed reality, retail AI, and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to say that in the, in the two uh, years and four months or something since we have formed my team, we have actually worked on capturing the voices of 11,000 plus diverse uh, community uh, members who are impacted by the technologies that we are building. So I'll stop here. Uh, thanks again. I can go next because I'm the odd woman out here. I'm the non-engineer. And, um, I, and I'm also slightly different because I represent another piece of diversity in that I'm older than most of the other people on this panel. Um, so I'm not going to go through my entire background because that'll take up the whole panel. So some highlights, I guess. Uh, I actually am a lawyer, so I was a barrister. That's the wig and gown person in the UK. I started working part-time as a judge for them to try me out and me to try them. And I hated being a judge. My work was around human trafficking, children and human rights. And in fact, I still belong to one of the foremost um, uh, entities of lawyers doing work on human rights. And um, my human trafficking experience actually sort of led me to thinking about what will this look like when we have AI? Um, and this was prior to Westworld. I should have written that series. Anyway, 
Um, so from there, I, I did my master's degrees in law and international relations, thinking about the geopolitical aspects of AI and also the, and also the legal aspects of the AI and what really that sort of led me uh, into a 10 hour plane flight um, with one of the only people on the planet at that time who would have known what I was talking about when I was talking about AI ethics. And he employed me to be the world's first chief, chief AI ethics officer. Um, and uh, that was 2014 when there were very few of us, um, you know, talking about AI ethics. We might have been thinking about it in the way that you were, but we weren't talking about it. So, you know, I was one of the few people who went to Azilomar to think about the Azilomar principles. I became the vice chair of the IEEE's work. Um, there were just 12 of us in December 2015. And thankfully there are now, we're spread out all around the world doing this work. And so I moved to the forum in 2017 because I wanted, as I think many of us on this program, uh, on this conference, to stop talking about some of these uh, issues and actually have some impact. And so what we do at the forum is we help companies and countries to devise governance mechanisms around artificial intelligence. And I say governance meet with a small g. We don't do regulation particularly, although in some cases, like the work we've been doing with Microsoft, we've been thinking about facial recognition. Maybe there's some reason to have um, regulation in, in that area. But we, we were, so we worked, for example, with the UK government to create, to co-create with them their principles around procurement of artificial intelligence for the government. And so we worked governments around the world and uh, companies around the world, nonprofits and academic, acad academics, because every project we do has to have that multi-stakeholder component. And um, I'm deeply grateful for being able to work with fabulous people around the world, um, both within the forum and in the communities that we build to carry out the projects. Wonderful. Wow, um, that's a tough one to follow. <laughs> but I have to say, according to my daughter, Kay, um, lawyers are also engineers. She says she's a social engineer. My daughter wants to be a lawyer. And I've been saying to her, don't be an engineer. She's like, you know what? We're social engineers. We change society for good. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm Rose Margaret Akemi Tua, and I'm a professor at Ohlone College. My journey has been quite interesting, spanning different um, continents. I think that has been a good opportunity for me. But um, my desire for AI and passion for AI or telecommunications really started when I was a kid. And um, we lived in Switzerland for a bit, and of course, um, I think we were one of the first black people in our neighborhood. So innocently, the kids were asking me, hey, do you guys live on trees in Africa, et cetera? And I was like, oh dear, no, we don't. <laughs> so I showed them photos, et cetera. But for me at that point um, was born the desire to help the world overcome certain biases and prejudices and some very innocently because probably that's what they were told, but that wasn't true. And so in high school, I really liked physics and um, I loved electromagnetism. And I was like, wow, I want to learn how to manipulate electromagnetic waveforms and um, help people communicate better. Well, fast track, um, I got my bachelor's degree in electrical electronics engineering, specialized in telecommunications in Nigeria, and then went for grad school in England. So, okay, we've got that in common too. <laughs> And um, I studied mobile and satellite communications for my master's. And then my real desire to understand pattern recognition um, and AI um, came to um, for during my PhD. I now did my PhD in cybernetics. And I was fortunate to work with a great professor at the University of Reading, Professor Kevin Warwick. And he's the first cyber the first human on the planet to ever be a cyborg, to allow um, a chip implant in him. And it was just so fascinating to see the possibilities of AI then. And then I now became a lecturer at the University of London 
and fast track, fast track, fast track. My desire for AI continued, but it even came to four more as I started teaching and noticed the discriminatory behavior of AI systems on my students, students of color, students of different underrepresented backgrounds, immigrants. And then I started getting really interested into investigating um, AI ethics. And um, as you all know, telecommunications has evolved a lot and gone into wireless sensor networks. And so now I also coordinate um, the Smart Manufacturing Technology Program at Ohlone College Industry 4.0. We're a national center of excellence, and we are the first in California, um, the first community college in California to have that program, just to again, try to mitigate um, certain AI issues in manufacturing, because believe it or not, there's AI issues, AI ethical issues in every single sector. So for me, I focus on AI in education and also for manufacturing. Mia, yeah, just, uh, just a quick comment on what Rose said, because I think it's important for us as women. You know, strong women create strong daughters. And so just as um, Rose's daughter is a lawyer, my daughter is actually an engineer. She flies in the United States Air Force as a pilot. And so, <laughs> so I think it's really important when we're talking about women and successful women, to realize that as mothers, we have a great responsibility in that as well. Absolutely. Well, that's so true. Awesome. <laughs> Very well said. You, you all have such amazing backgrounds and what I love about it is that you all complement each other. So together we can get a much more fuller picture, not just one dimensional views and also your backgrounds make uh, just this such a more interesting conversation to have. So we all talk about diversity, right? And there are so many different elements to dimensions of diversity. Can each of you share maybe in a few, um, like briefly, which, what is your organization's definition of diversity. Yeah, I, I can go. Um, so I think of diversity in a few different ways. One is people build products, right? Um, so it's very, very important that you involve multiple disciplines in your product development process. So it's not just engineers uh, building products, right? So you're bringing in uh, people from more human-centered uh, sort of disciplines like user researchers, anthropologists, designers, linguists, and all of that. And why is that important? Um, it's important because you've got to be able to challenge dominant views. And the only way you can do that is by bringing this kind of diverse thinking and be the voice of the end user or the community into product shaping. Uh, the other thing I feel is important is uh, bringing the perspectives of the community itself and not just do it once and forget about it, right? But doing that throughout the product development life cycle. So right from your envisioning of the product phase to post deployment, getting that continuous feedback from the community, super important. There are three ways we do that. Uh, we do that through uh, directly engaging with end users and by end users it's not Microsoft uh, you know uh, uh, employees right that's not representative of end user community by any means so it's really thinking about the diversity uh, the, the spectrum and uh, and especially um, thinking about who could be uh, marginalized um, with this particular technology and that's completely context specific that's very technology specific Right. So um, honestly, uh, we have worked with introverts, women, racial minorities, LGBTQ plus community, individuals with visual impairments, mobility impairments, because depending on the technology that you're developing, each of these groups could be considered vulnerable um, in that uh, domain. Um, it's important not to forget about your indirect stakeholders, so not just your end users, but how about the people whose jobs may be impacted by uh, the AI systems that you're building? So very important to think about that as well. Um, honestly, we have also worked with um, people who may have strong views uh, or even uh, object to the kind of work that you're working on, right? So we have worked with human rights groups. Uh, we have also created external advisory panels. Um, 
Why that's important is because more and more you see tech companies uh, entering into spaces that they are not uh, traditionally uh, have expertise in. Like for instance, a lot of tech companies are investing in military, for, uh, right? And uh, that's not a domain that you're naturally uh, comfortable in. So how do you leverage the expertise uh, of those who have, you know, um, learned the space uh, and um, so 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 what we have done in that process is really uh, creating external advisory panels with experts from various disciplines like um, military ethicists and um, experts in tech policy law and human system integration and all of that to help us think through some thorny issues um, and then of course uh, uh, lastly I think there is diversity because you need data for training models. And there is diversity when the data sets that are being used for training these AI models actually represent the diversity in society. Again, it's not just trained using, um, you know, just the majority, uh, which is, you know, white males, but it actually represents the diversity um, in, in the society. So I guess we can follow the same order. I'll go next. Um, and so working for something called the World Economic Forum, you know, we, we probably hit the uh, geographical diversity reasonably well because there are 94 different countries represented amongst our staff. But obviously that isn't enough to be just geographically diverse. We have to do more than that. Um, we, and it's essential for us to be able to carry out the work that we do, because as I said, we, we work with countries around the world. So I'm uh, working with 13 different countries at the moment, helping them to create various pieces of AI strategy and governance. Um, and so we need to think about national conversations. So for example, our, um, our partners at the New Zealand government are looking at, are at the moment in, the, in that national conversation around AI, um, which we're helping with. And um, I agree, we, you know, AI is human. A AI should be for the benefit of humans. And unless we get that right, we shouldn't be doing artificial intelligence at all. So we have rules at the forum about diversity. So, you know, Davos is a big thing that we do each year. And so there are rules about the panels, you know, how many women, um, how, how many persons of color. There are rules around making sure that we hear from as many different people as possible. We, my, my colleague Emily Rate and I have just put together the, what we call the Global Futures Council. And we specifically said, we want one person from Europe. We want one person from America. We want one person from, from Africa. We want one person from all these continents. Once we've done that, then we want to look at um, diversity within those groups as well so that we can produce a really diverse group of people that we bring together to think about the future of artificial intelligence and the, and the way that it can benefit humanity. And likewise, as we are thinking about um, the toy awards that we're going to be awarding in April next year for AI enabled toys, you know, we want to bring into the judges committee people from around the world and although toy awards and AI enabled toys sounds very much like a Western thing, um, what that will do and the, the work that we do in, in regard to this will actually help us to think through the issues around using AI for um, education, which obviously has fantastic potential around the world. So I guess I'm next. And um, I wish academia could borrow the World Economics Forum agenda or strategy uh, for diversity, but especially STEM or engineering um, uh, academia, because we're not there yet. 
Um, if you look at the number of um, female professors in engineering, we're not there yet. The number of um, underrepresented, ethnically um, underrepresented professors in engineering, we're not there yet. So um, in academia, we have a long way to go. And um, I would like to think of academia as the cradle that creates everything that eventually would funnel through to industry and help dive, um, create the diverse sort of products um, that um, all the other panelists have talked about. So I'll backtrack a little bit and just say that for us at Ohlone College and in academia with the group of people I'm working with, uh, we do not like to define diversity on its own. We say diversity needs to come with inclusion and also equity, else we would have spent a lot of money trying to get a diverse pool of people and then they leave. And that is the statistics in engineering for women. 40% of women that gain engineering degrees leave engineering. And so that is not what we want. So we initially start off with a diverse pool of people and then after they're all gone. And so there's a quote regarding diversity and inclusion, which I'll just say now, and it's all over the internet. So it's nothing brilliant that I cooked up. It says that um, I think diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And I think equity is dancing like no one is looking. And I think for me, that is where we're striving towards in academia, because we get students, but we lose them. We get minorities, we get diverse populations, but again, we lose them. And so um, diversity should never be on its own. It needs to come with inclusion and equity, else um, we just wasted our time. That is so true. And uh, thank you for sharing that. We had um, we made a special effort in our event today to invite working mothers who work in this space. And some of the statistics that they shared were very similar and they look pretty bleak because that's exactly it. It's not enough to say we have the doors open for women or minorities but or marginalized groups, but also creating an environment that fosters them, which is invite, which is welcoming. So they're not like you're bringing people in through the front door and they're just leaving and running out the back door. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so Rose, I have a question specifically just building on what you said. It was about, you said there are numbers. So my question was about metrics. Like how do we know, like are we measuring what matters? And that starts with what should we be measuring? Like what are some of the metrics? You mentioned uh, representation of women in academia and such. Are there others that you'd be looking at? And then I'd love to hear from RT as well as Kay what their thoughts are. Okay, thank you very much, Mia, for that question. And matrix is something that is constantly evolving and we're constantly looking at. And recently, I think with some of my colleagues and the different committees and boards that I belong to, we came to the conclusion that for the most part, we have been quantitative data driven. And so we have missed out on a lot of things. We've missed out on where we could have actually had special interventions to stop the, in quote, bleeding of underrepresented people from STEM. And so what we're trying to collect now is qualitative data how they actually feel so that um, once we get them through the door, we can try to create that sense of belonging and inclusion. And again, going back to AI systems, and I'll talk about this later on, I think it's a lot of data, data, data. Hey, we have XYZ amount of um, products out there, but there's no qualitative data to actually talk about the way people feel about it. For example, Amazon Echo, and I'll talk about it later. I love Amazon Echo, but it's one of the most discriminatory <laughs> products I know of. It discriminates against my accent because I, and I intentionally maintain my Nigerian British accent. And so my kids will now have to say, hey, mom, move over. I'll use my American accent. He's going to understand it. And even in my classrooms, it's the same thing. I ask my students to do some research, use your phones, use Google or Siri, and then it doesn't understand what you're saying. And so this is really not okay. And so we have lots of data here. We're churning out lots of different products, but we need to collect qualitative data if we really want to create an inclusive AI system, inclusive AI products and systems um, that um, will be sustainable. 
I agree with Rose. It doesn't recognize my English accent either. Um, and so I have to get my husband to translate for me. Um, and so I just want to add, uh, before I get to the World Economic Forum, I just want to add how difficult it is to change cultures as well. You know, uh, if you look at the United States Air Force, they have been recruiting for a long time or trying to recruit women for a long time to be pilots. The statistics say that if the number of women pilots, and I apologize for the puppy in the background playing, um, the, uh, the statistics say that they still only have 0.06% of women pilots. Now that's cultural. You know, we have to change the, we, it's so difficult because it's not just the KPIs, we also have to change our culture in um, adapting to having more women or persons of color or any other diversity and inclusion and, and being truly inclusive, as Rose said. So going on to the World Economic Forum, you know, we do have KPIs, as I said, for the way that we choose panels at well, our big events like Davos and, and SDI, which is the one that we have for around the SDGs in September, and regional meetings, etc. Uh, we have as a an AI team because, just as Rose said, you know, you notice the problems with lack of diversity and inclusion so much in AI. Um, we we've been making a a special effort to go out and look for people who would not be the normal people in our communities. And one of the problems um, for, the, for the forum is, you know, you, you get the person that the, that the company sends to you or the government sends to you. So you have to make that special extra effort to reach out to the right academics or the right countries or um, the right nonprofits to make sure that you do have that very diverse group. Uh, can I pause before we go to Arthi? Can we see your puppy? Please. <laughs> I feel one of the benefits or just the upsides of being able to zoom from anywhere. Oh my God, he's adorable. I thought this is a special treat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. He can hang out with us. That's okay. We have a very inclusive group. Four babies, human babies, everybody's welcome here. Oh, what's his name? Her name is Lulu, which is, oh. stands for fearless warrior. And when she bites me like this, I can see it. Oh my God. That was <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. She is fierce. So I can tell like this is a family of just fierce women. Um, and everybody's loving her. So thank you. <laughs> uh, Arati, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, diversity in AI. Um, I don't think we are there yet in terms of having metrics per se uh, to your progress. But at the very minimum, what I would say is having at least a set of processes in place so that you're systematically doing um, a few things like, you know, like, have you thought about who are the individuals or groups who could be impacted by what you're building? You know, if you're if you're collecting data for training models, I mean the stuff that Rose just talked about, which is uh, as well as Kay, which is oh my God, this uh, system does not recognize my speech. I'm actually working on a speech fairness project, so that's super funny that you both mentioned that. And it's it's really hard to uh, to work in that space to improve fairness um, in in speech. Uh, but anyhow, it's very important to systematically think through the composition of your training data and assess what's missing. How are you benchmarking between different groups so that it doesn't work well for just one group and leaves out the rest of us who were not potentially, uh, you know, born uh, or raised here and does not speak a certain way, right? Um, does the system uh, unintentionally exclude certain people uh, based on their abilities uh, or something about themselves that they cannot change? What is the impact of the system on vulnerable groups? 
Do you have the right feedback mechanisms in place to continuously get this feedback from your impacted community versus, you know, waiting till shit just goes, uh, you know, uh, going down and then just hearing uh, uh, about stuff when that happens. So these are all things that you have to think through very systematically uh, throughout your product life cycle. So, uh, yeah, so that's what I think. Uh, at some point, yes, you should have some sort of metrics in place, but um, we're not there yet. That is absolutely fair. I, it's so nice. And even that, I feel like even the fact that we're having this conversation is a great start. And I always look at it as a journey. We are not going to get there overnight, but it's wonderful just be able to have this open conversation. Um, so we, I would love to now dive deep into each one of your roles because again, every one of you brings a very unique perspective, right? Um, Arthi, you represent a big, large corporation. Um, Rose is with um, higher education and then Kay with World Economic Forum. So starting with you, Arthi, can we talk about more, um, some details on a project where you have included this diverse perspective? You alluded to some, and then uh, there was a, actually a question in there about your training data set. If you'd like to share more about that as well, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Um, so we try to do that on almost all projects that we work on. Um, the way we work is we partner very closely with product teams, uh, you know, embed very closely with them and try to make sure that we think about all the different community members who could be impacted and really try to bring their voices in. I'm going to speak about uh, one particular project per se, because it's really nice to see the spectrum of the individuals that we got to interact with. It's, uh, it's a project on custom neural voice. Um, so the whole idea behind the technology is, um, you know, you take 500 to 1000 utterances of one person, um, and you're able to create a voice font that uh, represents you. So it's, 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 a, it's a likeness of you, right? But the problem with that is it could go ahead and say a lot of things that you never said. So, so the misuse of the system can result in lots of issues, right? It's like a fundamental threat uh, to public trust and, uh, and, and just, uh, you know, your human rights, right? So uh, what, I mean, we did a lot of things, but for uh, simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna touch on a few things uh, on this project. Um, we started off serving the general public to understand their perceptions towards a technology like this in different domains, right, in different scenarios. What do they think about uh, this technology? And remember, this is like pretty good technology, like it, it, it sounds really uh, good. Um, you could be easily fooled. Um, so based on the um, surveys and the interviews that we did with consumers, who, you know, people who could be general consumers of this product, what we learned was that the number one thing that's important is disclosure. So it's very important to uh, minimize any sort of deception. So disclose uh, to the uh, consumer that you're actually interacting with a synthetic agent. I mean, this happened with Google Duplex, if you remember, several years ago when, um, uh, when Sundar was trying to demo uh, the program and got a huge backlash because uh, it was like, oh my God, this is so realistic, but is this really a synthetic agent? So uh, disclosing um, that is very important. Um, the other important thing is if the system is high fidelity, so in other words, it really, really uh, sounds like you, then your expectations from the system is also high. So in other words, if you're using uh, that voice, let's say for a transaction, right? A financial transaction or uh, making a travel uh, a reservation or something, it's, it's super important that it's high fidelity even in, those, in, in that scenario. Uh, what I'm trying to say is if the capabilities and limitations of the system do not match the high fidelity, then the trust that the end user can have on the system can go really bad. Um, and uh, really being cautious about um, where you deploy these systems. You don't want to use synthetic voice, uh, especially one that's like really high fidelity in, a, in an emergency scenario, you know, where you're calling 911 and you're interacting with a human sounding synthetic voice. So these are some of the things that we learned from our consumers. And that then ended up being in our disclosure guidelines or uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, deployment guidelines um, that we provide uh, as a platform builder. Um, that we provide to our customers, to Microsoft's customers. 
Um, we also uh, interviewed voice actors. Uh, now, they are not the users of this technology per se, but they are a group of individuals who are indirectly impacted by technology because this technology could potentially take away their job, right? Um, so what we heard um, from them was concerns over really, they wanted control over how their voice font should be used and they should they wanted to be compensated each time it was being used because it, it is like derived from their voice font. And this resulted in, um, again, transparency guidelines that we created uh, towards uh, voice actors and having clear contractual specifications on how the voice uh, could be used, a duration of use, a fair compensation, all of that stuff. Uh, we also worked with individuals with speech impairments to understand what are their specific needs when interacting with something like synthetic uh, voice, because this is presumably a technology that would really, really bolster their autonomy. So we learned a lot of things uh, from them that we take for granted. And that's why it's like super important to bring in that diverse perspectives, right? Otherwise we are designing things for us, you know, for, uh, for us. And we are not thinking about the whole uh, diversity of uh, your users. So what we learned from these group of individuals is flexibility in wanting to change things about their pitch and their accent and other voice characteristics because they struggle a lot with these things, right? And what about if it's a kid uh, who has a speech impediment? Uh, as the kid reaches puberty, they want uh, an ability to make modifications uh, to their voice form so that they sound like an adult versus as a kid. So this again uh, resulted in a set of design considerations visuals with speech impediments. And all of these um, then resulted in a set of guidelines that we created uh, for our uh, customers. Uh, I hope I answered your first part of your question. Um, I think you raised a, a question on fairness. Yeah, so uh, speech fairness um, is something that I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, top of the mind for me right now. Uh, back in March, a study uh, was published by Stanford. I mean, it's not surprising the results, but uh, we, uh, uh, a study was um, published wherein they showed that um, the performance of automatic, automatic speech recognition systems are poorer for certain demographics, uh, such as uh, specifically in this case, um, a black and African American uh, population in comparison to um, Caucasians. And uh, so we're trying to solve that problem. I mean, uh, really the root cause here is the lack of representation in the data, right? So the step uh, zero is really collecting more data, but it's not as simple as saying just collect more data. When you think about data collection, you have to think about what regions in the United States should you be sampling from? Uh, what are the criteria is important, like the gender uh, identity, you know, it may be different for females versus males. What about other things like, um, uh, age groups, uh, where you learn the language, uh, at what age did you acquire it, um, whether you have probably have uh, you know speech impediments or not, your speech delivery characteristics. You see what I'm saying? So there are lots of factors that uh, come into play and uh, coming up with a priority list of what things are most important to, uh, to, uh, to prioritize and uh, in step zero or phase zero of a data collection and then making progress, right? Because it's, it's, it's a journey, like you said earlier, it's a journey. Um, so it's, it's hard. It's very important, but it's really hard. So my point being, um, operationalizing ethics and diversity and all of these concepts is requires a lot of intentional investment and a lot of thinking. I think the key word here, exactly what you said, is being intentional. It's 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 not as easy. Okay, we'll put a tweet out there, or we'll have an Instagram post, and this is your here's a PR statement right, on diversity, to actually operationalize, put it into action, considerations that you mentioned. That was super insightful. Thank you so much. Um, because those are the details that a lot of folks are not privy to, very simply because the scale at which a company has to operationalize is not always visible. So thank you for sharing that. I just want to add one more thing, because that's relevant, which is one particular discipline cannot come in and solve this problem. So this is what I was saying earlier. Um, to solve this, it requires a village 
Um, because just as right now on this particular project, uh, we are partnering with, of course, the engineers who are responsible for the speech platform, but we have user researchers working on it. We have uh, Microsoft uh, research MSR uh, experts uh, who are experts in fairness uh, uh, partnering with us. We have uh, social linguists who are helping us. So it actually takes a village to systematically think through all of these issues. So diversity in your organization and having that safe space to actually think through these things in a systematic manner, that is really, really important for success. Agree. Okay. Amen. Uh, th th thank you so much for that super detailed, insightful look at how things actually get operationalized. Uh, so why don't we move to, um, to a different perspective? Nakke mentioned at World Economic Forum, she's been working with governments to responsibly adopt. Now that is another whole level, right, of complexity. So Kay, can you share your perspective from a working with large organizations is one thing, but you're working at governmental scale. So do you want to, you're, you're on mute. Uh, so we do, we do um, also work with, with companies and um, we've actually got a fabulous piece of work that we're doing around um, tech ethics. They're so not just AI ethics, but responsible use of, of technology generally. And, you know, very happy to have Microsoft as a partner for that. Um, and so, uh, where to start? Yes, it, it's hard working with, with countries, but um, the countries come to us because they all want to do the right thing, and many of them don't know where to start. Um, and so, I, I tend to ask them to start with an AI strategy. So that they can, you know, just as a company would start with a strategy of what they want to do, so should a country, because then they can think about what it is that's important to them in the AI space, what they want to achieve with AI, and then how to put in the financial, the foundational underpinnings of it, which I, in which I would include the diversity, the inclusion, the equality, the human-centered the bias, the fairness, the, um, all the other pieces of the, of the jigsaw that is AI ethics. Um, and so, you know, it's no use a country sort of saying, well, we want to use AI in agriculture and we want to make agriculture better without really sort of thinking through all those very foundational pieces of what do we need to put in place in order to make this AI for agriculture piece work and work for the citizen and the human being um, and, and not be AI for AI's sake because it's an interesting buzzword at the moment. So just to give you an example of the sort of things that we're doing, um, facial recognition, a lot of people didn't want to take on facial recognition and I work very closely with Brad Smith who's um, president of Microsoft and um, we're privileged to have him as co-chair of our Global AI Council and you know we both spoke in Davos about two years ago saying we need to do something about facial recognition and um, and its deployment and so we did we with the French government we've been looking at what would be the right uh, rules, again with a small r, for deployment of AI in facial recognition um, commercially. And we're just extending that project with Unicre, Interpol and uh, various police forces around the world to tackle that thorny issue that we are seeing, you know, what, is, what are our rights as human beings compared to the right of governments and companies to use facial recognition. And that bleeds into the work that we do. When you're talking about diversity, we, we believe very strongly that, that children are absolutely vital to our future because they are our future. And so we need them included in the conversations. So when I was talking about the toy awards, you know, facial recognition is used by some of these toys. So what are the issues that we should be examining there? What's the advice we should be giving to parents? Um, what's the advice that governments should be having and the actions that 
government should be having. So we've worked closely with UNICEF on the paper that they now have out for public consultation around the use of AI by children and for children. Um, then I, I told you about the work that we do, we're doing with New Zealand around reimagining regulation. And if it's not, not regulation in the traditional legal sense, what is it with regard to AI? And um, having that public discourse. Um, and then with the UK government, for example, as I say, really working to not only provide guidelines, but to provide a handbook. That was what, you know, everybody, we're all looking at operationalizing ethics. You can't just um, say, well, you know, here are some te 10 high level guidelines, get on with it. You've actually got to give these poor procurement officers the tools that they can use to actually translate those 10 principles into action. So that's the sort of work that we've been doing and, and really important, you know, we included a lot of the diversity pieces in all the work that we've been doing with governments and particularly, for example, in New Zealand, where, you know, they have this wonderful inclusion of the, of the Aboriginal culture, the Maoris, in all that they do. That's wonderful. We actually had a session earlier today when um, on indigenous protocols and inclusion in AI. So that definitely resonates. It, thank you so much, Ake, for sharing that insight. Again, we're getting insights that we wouldn't normally get because we are not privy to those details and the level that you work at at the government level. Uh, so insights are really super helpful. So uh, moving on to uh, Rose. Rose, uh, you offer a very different perspective. You are higher education, um, and you recently were nominated to the Board of Directors for the Society of Women Engineers. You're really a force to be reckoned with. So can you share, Rose, like what is your perspective? How are you going to change the world? Like you have the power. <laughs> How are you going to make sure <laughs> that people, are, uh, organizations are being more inclusive and it's more um, of a welcoming environment for women engineers? Thanks for that. Yeah, it was an honor to serve on the board of directors for the Society for Women Engineers. And um, we are definitely um, trying to get the job done. And our approach or my personal approach is just one person at a time, one organization at a time. And that is how we can truly make an impact. And so um, using the platform that SWE has provided for me, um, I have been able to connect also with the IEEE. I'm a member of the IEEE and um, I'm actually the chair of the IEEE Special Interest Group for Humanitarian Technology, Oakland is based section. And um, fortunate to work with people that are on the standards for the Internet of Things Committee. And so we're working on democratizing the internet because I think we can talk about AI systems all day, but if we do not have the internet Wi-Fi access available to everyone, everything AI is lost. And so AI um, works on the internet of things. So we're strongly working on the democratization of the internet so that it's available, affordable for everyone, especially marginalized societies. And so again, with that role, we are paying special attention, um, giving scholarships through SWE to lots of underrepresented students, especially post COVID-19 and during COVID-19, because again, um, with everything going remote, all educational platforms now being online, um, marginalized societies now face even a double, should I call it double whammy? <laughs> because of, I mean, they already have this, the problem of the digital divide, and then now, again, everything has moved online, and they need to work with all these interesting AI systems. So we're also working on trying to ensure that every child, every, every student has a laptop to work with, has internet access. And especially we're focusing on, focusing on girls and um, women. I'll say women because in my class I have women, some are older than me. And so just making sure that they have access um, because some of them are mothers and they're, um, they have kids and we need to make sure that they have access to the right digital equipment to help them succeed. And then also on a, on a personal level, just looking at education generally, um, I'm also focusing on discriminatory behavior by AI systems in education, especially when it comes to proctoring exams. And so I'm not going to mention the platforms 
here, but there are several platforms out there that are being used to proctor exams, tests, and quizzes that have been known to really discriminate between people of color or women. And basically these systems are using how often you blink your eye. So an average black person probably blinks their eye more, how slow your hand moves. And I'm, I'm like, geez, this is not okay. And so you find out after an exam, a, a professor would say, oh, you cheated, you were slow. You, your hand motion, your eye was blinking too fast because we're relying on this, um, should I say erroneous AI systems. And so that is one of the things that we're really taking on board trying to give feedback to some of these platforms that uh, they're exhibiting discriminatory behavior. And as a result, we're seeing that underrepresented students are not doing well in this online learning environment. Um, and really no fault of theirs is because of the proctoring systems that are not, um, um, that are not um, inclusive. Another issue that we're working on in education is just humanizing AI systems. Our students face a lot of mental health issues in California. We've had um, COVID, we've had, well, nationally we had George Floyd, and then we had wildfires. It's like, okay, right, what else? Um, and so we see that lots of our students are going through mental health issues. And then they log into an online system, an AI online system, and it's still busy talking like a robot. No human feelings, no how was your day. I think Alexa is a little bit better now, but other systems, there's no human element to it. And so it is extremely important, and I'm glad that the operations people and product designers <laughs> like Arathi are here to take on board the humanizing element of of AI, it's so important. And um, I have to say um, some AI systems are actually causing more mental health issues for people than, than normal. But I want to also give a shout out to Microsoft. I like Microsoft Teams. <laughs> I think Microsoft Teams has taken on board Research I did for my PhD and I was like, wow, did they look into my thesis? And um, just really understanding generational cognitive orientation mindsets. And I think uh, Microsoft has really pinned that in understanding the flow, the AI flow, the flow and navigation um, that suits the current generation that we're dealing with. And that's why I think um, in academia, Microsoft Teams might be the next big thing and is really getting embraced. And um, do I have any other thing? I think I will stop there. There's a lot, but I think for us, the important thing is to ensure that every girl, every woman, every person has in access to the internet and they have a digital equipment to work with and they feel included uh, with whatever AI platforms that they're using. Well, Rose, I've said this before and say this again. If you ever run for office, <laughs> I want to run <laughs> for public office. I'm totally coming and working on your campaign because that was what you shared was just brilliant. And I love that you pointed out inclusion means even access to technology. We live in a bubble in the Bay Area via Zoom. There's Wi-Fi everywhere, and that's such a fallacy. So um, we only have ten minutes, uh, eight minutes actually, just for keeping an eye on time. So I have a question. Um, maybe you can touch on it lightly, or maybe we can go to Kay and come back to you, and then Artie. Um, the recent protest against flawed algorithms, right? There's literally at the intersection of this education, there's biased and discriminatory algorithms, what the students in um, are going through when AI um, is, is assessing their scores based on prior, their past um, scores. So can you uh, share a little bit more about your thoughts? I'll let you and Kate decide who wants to go first, but it's about the A-levels and the students who are protesting in UK recently. Well, I'll go first really with the with the sort of bigger picture and then Rose can talk about the, the, the student experience, I think. I think it's really important that um, we see this as even more of a wake up call to all of us, whether we're governments, sorry, that's the cat. Um, <laughs> this is becoming a zoo, um, domestic zoo, uh, zoom instead, sorry. Um, and so, you know, whether it's governments or, and the way that they think about, um, as they did in the UK, using uh, Ofqual to um, create algorithms or buy-in algorithms that 
were obviously flawed. Um, so it's a wake up call, I think, to governments. I think it's a wake up call to companies who are providing this. I hope it's a wake up call to the companies that will be using AI that are not the Microsofts of this world. So the non-technology companies who will be using AI and don't have the foundational ethics programs that, that um, the tech companies have been able to um, create. You know, there's a Gartner survey out there that by 20, a uh, Gartner report out there that by 2022, unless we get a handle on bias, 85% of the algorithms that we create will be erroneous. Um, so it's, it's part of this big picture of what I would call tech clash that we were talking about in 2019. And um, it's important because, you know, there was this sort of everything, AI will be able to solve everything in COVID and it'll be amazing. And we lost for a while the conversation around the problems of AI that we need to solve before we can use it for the benefit of humanity. And so I think that this is an important wake up call. So that's the big picture. I'll leave Rose to talk about the impact for the poor students involved. Thank, Thank you very much, Kay, for giving us that great big picture. And um, I think on the student's perspective, the, the ramifications are far reaching. It's a ripple effect. And I have to say, sometimes we see one person, one student, but that student is connected to so many other people, their parents, their grandparents, their sisters, their sibling. And so this is a ripple effect. Once a student, like the case in the UK, where basically they were using algorithms that use data, um, that they used historical data on performance of schools. And so they basically marked down students that were in schools, catchment areas that historically hadn't performed well. And so that affected even students that would have normally perfected well and so um, performed better. And so this was clear discrimination. But at the same time, I'm like, maybe it was <laughs> just outright laziness. That's what I thought, because nobody just wanted to do the work. And in engineering, we have this phrase, garbage in, garbage out. And so for me, I'm like, it's no surprise you're trading in all data. You're going to get all the manifestations, all the same things, racial injustice, biases, et cetera, that we've always had because we're using old data. And so I think in the AI community, engineering, science, government, everyone, we need to be ready to do the work. If we really, I think that AI has a lot of opportunities to help break the um, biases and prejudices and discriminatory behavior, but we've got to invest and do the work to really start gathering new data. We're still using old data, and that's why we're getting the manifestations that we're getting, but they're really adversely affecting students. Um, so I call out to everyone, let's do the work, get new data, and then we're actually going to see the impact and effect we really want to see in um, breaking gender and um, ethnic biases. And just echoing Rose, you know, let's do the work. Let's not imagine that AI is going to be able to do everything for us. And let's, as a first principle, say, do we need AI here? Or is there a better way of approaching this? Indeed, indeed. Um, thank you. We're last, uh, down to the last three minutes. I would love to get Arthi to start us off with. Just in the last few minutes, Arthi, can you share some specific tools and techniques and actions that you would recommend that audience uses for ethical development? Any of your favorite tools? What's working well for you? Sure, sure, sure. I think the first thing uh, is what Kay just said, which is, is this really a technology problem? You know, uh, what am I trying to solve here? Is it really a technology problem? Uh, then it's really articulating um, the impact of the technology. You know, uh, the, the example that you just gave. Um, if the developers had done some homework in terms of determining what are the benefits versus the risks uh, of this technology to disadvantaged communities, or disadvantaged uh, students uh, from certain backgrounds, this would have been this would not have happened right so i believe um, we have another session um, uh, from the microsoft uh, uh, folks today and uh, harmony is going to walk through harms modeling that's something that we do that works really well for us 
which is we systematically sit with product teams and think through who are the stakeholders of the technology, what could be the benefits, what could be the harms, what are the different types of harms, and what are the ways we can mitigate these through research and design by bringing the perspectives of the community. So, um, so, so, that, so that's what I would uh, re uh, recommend, which is, is this a tech problem? Do some sort of impact assessment, uh, analyze, you know, uh, use your analytical approaches and think through the harms and what can go wrong. Use empirical approaches as well, which is bring in uh, the community because there is nothing like hearing directly from the community. There's no substitute for that. And then, of course, all the fantastic principles uh, that we have around Microsoft has its own ethical principles, uh, six ethical principles, fair, um, fairness and inclusiveness and transparency, privacy, security, thinking through all of these uh, and making sure that all of this is thought through while you're developing um, products. And of course, People, I, I say this, uh, I don't, uh, this, this, this is so important, which is people develop technologies. So giving them a safe space to, uh, to ask these questions, which requires a lot of leadership support um, and creating that safe environment for people and even incentivizing them for a responsible product development. Yeah, that's what I would say. Very well said. It needs a human in the loop always. Uh, so, Rose and Kate, any closing thoughts on any tools that you've seen that are working really well? I've heard of what, I'd like, what uh, Arthi just shared. Are there anything else you'd like to add before we end this? Well, I think, I think it's just a question of continuing to go back to the question of looking at your teams and say uh, for diversity, thinking about the product for inclusive, inclusivity and equality. Um, and, you know, we are a very small team, but we have a diversity champion now as a result of some of the problems that we were seeing. And just every week, um, our diversity champion brings us a diversity moment, which makes sure that we're reflecting all the time on, the, on these really important issues. Um, and I think also, you know, I. I would obviously say that even if you're a startup, you shouldn't be ignoring this. You know, there's a lot of people who say, oh, startups should have some sort of a, a buy on um, ethics because they're a startup and they won't get money and, and they won't be able to innovate. But actually, do we want companies out there that don't have any ethical compass when it, when it comes to AI? I don't think we do. And I think the third thing is, you know, let's try and encourage women and people of color founders. Um, so that again is one of those systemic problems. We don't have enough money flowing into to that community for all the store who are all trying to make their mark in this area. Uh, I would definitely echo what. Um... Kay said, and also what Arathi said, wealth creation is extremely important. And um, UNESCO um, created a white paper, um, published a white paper, I think last year, on the opportunities and um, challenges of AI in education. Well, I'm an educator, so I focused on education. But they have this competition, the Global Learning X Prize, each year just asking AI developers to come together and create inclusive equitable platforms for education. So anyone that likes the education space, and I think that's the hot cake now, <laughs> um, should definitely look into that from UNESCO and um, the Global Learning Prize. Um, but I, in conclusion, I just want to say that as an engineer, just as humans, we create technology to advance humanity. And so let's constantly weigh this anytime we sit down together to design AI systems and ask the question, are we truly advancing humanity or are we taking humanity back? Words. And that's my conclusion. Oh, beautifully and so eloquently stated. Thank you so much. It's again, it's all about the humans. Um, so I'd like to just say uh, thank you, panel, so much for those amazing insights. And I feel like every time I talk to amazing women like yourself, I, myself and the audience just walk away a little bit smarter and more aware. Um, so thank you for your time. I know it's a very busy time for everyone. Appreciate that. I'd like to give a shout out to our 
our host for uh, today's event is uh, Microsoft and Josh, Alexa are our partners at Microsoft. Amazing individuals, it's just a delight to work with them and they've been such amazing partners for all the work that we do with women in AI ethics. Always there, what do you guys need? How can we help? Um, so today's event would not have been possible and they're also uh, making sure that we have um, the recordings of all of our sessions, 12 entire hours <laughs> captioned. So uh, otherwise, it's all in spirit of making everything accessible. So thank you so much for jo to Josh and Alexa for making this happen and thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we will now shift to the next, um, we will be sharing with you one of our most diverse programs and one of our most successful programs, which is the AI Ethics Mentoring Program. I'd love to um, just invite you to take a look at the program because we are looking for more amazing women to join our network. And Kay is a mentor. Oh my God. Yes, Kay is amazing. And she's one of our most popular mentors. So just so you know, uh, it's, um, so we'd love to invite more women. So I leave it to um, Amrithi to kick us off with the recording of the session. And with that, I'll close out this one. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ray, and I'm going to be talking to you about our mentors and mentees around the world. The AI Ethics Mentoring Program started as a way to support women and non-binary people during the global pandemic. Since we started in March of this year, we've had over 130 participants from over 25 countries. Today, I'll be introducing some of our amazing participants. First, we have Kittis, a mentee. She is a graduate student of African Masters in Machine Intelligence at Ames, Rwanda. She's from Ethiopia, and her mentor is Ashley Wilson. A fun fact about Kittis is that she loves cats and even got one to co in college. <laughs> Next, we have Margie, another mentee. Margie works as an AI, ML, Engineering Program and Product Manager, and she's located in Seattle, Washington. Her mentor is Renee Cummings, and Renee has inspired her to remember why her perspectives, her perspectives and experiences matter. A fun fact about Margie is that she loves traveling and used to be a volunteer beekeeper at the Garfield Park Conservatory. Then we have Anna, another one of our amazing mentees. Her mentor is also Anna. She is working on and is interested in AI governance and AI for SDGs. She lives in Tbilisi, Georgia, and recently founded a nonprofit organization, AI Governance International, and, is, founding, and found, is a founding editorial board member of Springer's AI and Ethics Journal. Anna, lives, uh, Anna is hoping to head to Berlin, Germany soon, no matter how impossible it might be right now. Anna's mentor, Anna, is an advanced analytics senior manager in BBVA, as well as a World Economic Forum fellow in AIML and a C4IR in San Francisco. She mentored Anna as well as Indira, and it was and she says it was amazing to hear about their projects and ideas from both of them. Anna just moved to San, from San Francisco to Madrid, Spain, and a fun fact about her is she's back to growing her own vegetables. Chavi is actually a mentor and a mentee. She enjoys red wine and yoga sometimes together. Her mentor is Megana and she mentors Mira and Angel. She is a passionate researcher, a scholarly publishing, publishing, Uh, that appears to be the video that I was sent. Oh, uh, I think we may have sent you the wrong version, uh, but we'll just leave it at that because the, the gist of it is we have an amazing program. We have some amazing folks who are 
doing some great work. Everybody's stepping up to helping uh, other women and non-binary folks. And all I can say is we are so grateful. We are looking for more mentors. So if um, you can spare the time and uh, make the time to help other women, we'd so appreciate it. And this also seems to be an imposter syndrome, but many of our mentees are incredible. They're just powerful women and they just don't feel like they're qualified. And to them, we would just say, if you don't think you are, you probably are qualified. So just just go for it, just try it. You never know until you try. We're just saying, you know, we believe in you. Uh, so that was pretty much our program update. Uh, what I would love to do is uh, shift gears and just hand this over to the um, transition over to our next phase of our event, which is going to be, we'll be going into workshop that Microsoft's uh, team is hosting, Harmony Mabry and uh, Danielle will be hosting. So I just wanted to um, make sure if I'm, I'm not missing anything, am I, Josh, Alexa, Danielle, I think you are all on. Okay, lovely. And Harmony. Okay, because this, uh, this is the point we'll be handed, uh, handed off. You're in good hands with Harmony and uh, Danielle. So All right, it. can you guys hear me okay? Perfect, yes. Hi everybody, I'm Danielle Cass and I'm with Microsoft's Ethics and Society. So first a huge, huge thank you and props to Mia and the whole women and AI ethics team for organizing today's event and huge kudos to all of you that have hung in there to this point, it's been a long day. Before we dive into harms modeling and how it's a practice you can apply tomorrow when you get back to the office to really build a foundation for ethical AI, I just have to say it's really amazing to see how the Women in AI Ethics Summit has grown since two years ago when um, inspired by Mia's list of 100 brilliant women in AI ethics, my dear friend Kathy Baxter, who leads ethical AI at Salesforce, um, and I thought, what if we get all these women in the room to, in a room together and see, like, let's collaborate. So we organized the first summit two years ago in a little conference room in, in Salesforce. Mia was there. We had two dozen women. And so it's so amazing to see how Mia has grown this. So kudos and props to you. So speaking of sharing and learning from each other, it's really a treat for me now that we get to share with you the work that my colleague Harmony Mabry is leading across Microsoft's cloud and AI product group. So she, Harmony is a uh, principal PM and harms lead on our ethics and society team, which you heard a little bit about from Arthi. And um, we, she's gonna walk you through this hands-on workshop and give you some tools you can use. And we have five amazing colleagues of Harmony's and Arthi's in mind to help you. We're gonna kind of get into breakout sessions. So we have Catherine Pratt, Josie Young, Rachel Kellum, Sanghi Oh and Sharon Lois. You'll see us popping in and out of the Zoom breakout rooms. So with that, I hand it over to Harmony to take you on this journey. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danielle. And thanks, you know, I'm really excited to be here and have this chance to share with all of you. Um, so as Danielle said, what I'm going to do today, this is really where we get into like workshop and we'll have interactive sessions mode. So um, you know, as Danielle mentioned, so we work within, and as Arthi mentioned before in the panel, we work within the cloud and AI group within uh, um, Microsoft. And so really what that means is that we're embedded side by side working with the technology teams themselves, building tools, building techniques, trying things out. Um, and one of our goals in doing that is to also be able to share with the community as well, because we know that a lot of this space is new. We're all learning. We're all developing new techniques, right, in this new space. and um, you know, I, I was able to listen to some of the sessions along the way today, and there's so many great um, issues and considerations and, and areas that were brought up. And so um, those are all things that we try and bring into the table as we start applying these techniques to bring ethics like really tangibly and practically into product development. And so with that, what I'm going to do. So one of the things I wanted to start with. Um, so a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight as I introduce this technique and we're going to the first session, I'm going to introduce it kind of at a high level. Then we'll have a bit of an exercise so you'll have a chance to interact with it and engage with it. Um, and then in the second hour, we'll actually have a chance to do it in more depth with small group exercises and breakout rooms. And so we'll have some chance. I want you all to have a chance to like really kind of feel, feel with it or feel it up, feel it around, get a feel for it and work with it. Um, and then we're also going to give you some resources and tools that you can take and then like to Danielle, as Danielle said, take it back to your practice and apply it and interact with it and give us feedback on it because that's really what we would love to have. Um, and so as part of this harm modeling technique, context is incredibly important. So I want to start with explaining 
our context for how we came up with this and how we built it. Um, because that influences the shape of it and the frame of it. Um, and so kind of, um, you know, Brad Smith was mentioned earlier for his work with the World Economic Forum. And so he is our um, president and chief legal officer. And um, he wrote a book really thinking about the socio-technical um, issues around this evolution of technology, what he calls sort of the fourth industrial revolution with, um, with AI and, um, and really examining those. And I think we're, all of us who work at Microsoft are very fortunate that as a company, they've chosen to put responsibility and ethics and intentionality um, really core to how we build technology and how we pre present technology into the world. So that's like first step. And, um, and also that they've invested in that. So they put money in funding teams with Arthi and I and all my colleagues who are on the call as well. That's like, we feel very fortunate and we feel very like lucky that the team, that the company is able to invest in that. Um, and that's another reason why we want to be able to share that with others. Um, the other important thing as we think about the context of how we built this tool and like where it comes from, it starts really from a standpoint, not only of that we have a responsibility for what we put out in the world and the uh, impact that it has, but also um, that the, anything that we develop, any technology that we put into the world or make available to the world is not being dropped into a vacuum. It's being dropped into very complex social and societal structures in processes, in you know, the way people communicate, in the way people are productive, in the way that people think about the world and truth and all of those things. And so in order to effectively be able to build technology, we really need to be able to um, think very deeply and be very mindful about those contexts, recognizing that when we introduce something, it changes the context that it's interacting with. And so those are the areas that we really start from as our, as our kind of starting point. Now, the other thing that's really important and that, that really comes out of this kind of ethos is that, um, I was going somewhere. Oh yeah, is, is that, um, shoot. Anyway, I'll get into that more. Um, oh yes. So is that the thing that we realized is that as technology builders, I think we're all kind of as an industry coming to a place of recognizing that this is really important, recognizing that intentionality and mindfulness and clear tangible techniques are really important, um, but also recognizing that a lot of those techniques don't exist yet or have not existed yet. Um, and so that's why we like focus really on what are these repeatable tools and processes and methods that we can apply and build. And that's really where harms modeling came from. Um, the goal here is really to give tech builders, designers, engineers, data scientists, um, all sorts of disciplines that are involved in creating a technology uh, to be able to have a technique they can apply to really anticipate how might this technology impact others um, and, and put them in the mindset of understanding that they are not the end user. They are not the, you know, the ultimate person who is going, they can't predict necessarily, right? And so the goal here is to um, outline the space and help them kind of define this space and know where we need to go deeper do more research, engage more with diverse populations. And so, so I mentioned context and I'm gonna keep mentioning context because it's incredibly important. So now as we start actually like applying this technique, I'm gonna like dive into the ways that we do this and how we start to like dig into it. So one of the areas is the context of the technology itself, right? So technology capabilities, what is it that we're actually trying to, what is the technology making possible that wouldn't otherwise be possible. We heard from the panel a little bit before that sometimes it's like, is this really even a technical problem we're trying to address? Or is it even appropriate to apply technology? That's kind of one of the ways that we get to this is thinking, what is this unique about this technology? How does it enhance human capability, augment human capability? And then the other thing is like, really what's the intended use? What is that problem or new thing that we're trying to make possible very specifically? So what is it the task that a human might want to do that it's going to augment? So as we work with product teams, it's all about defining these elements. And we want to define these starting from a positive place of saying like, knowing it's tech builders, we want to innovate and do cool things and change the world in a positive way, but we need to like define what that means, define what our goals are very specifically. How should it be used? How shouldn't it be used? Um, and then we get into stakeholders. So for whom? Arthi talked a lot about this if you were on the panel before now. 
um, really about, so the way we start to actually break out stakeholders or think, think broadly about this um, in a really structured way. One is uh, project sponsors. So you can imagine the whole thing about follow the money and, and the money matters, like the people who are ultimately paying to use this technology are paying to have this technology created, have a strategy, have a point of view that's going to influence the way that the technology is designed and the goals of the technology, what defines success. Then we think about the tech builders themselves. All of us have our own perspectives and our own ethos and our own kind of point of view that can influence the decisions we make throughout the technology design and development process. And it's important to recognize that. It's not that they don't exist, it's just important that we be very mindful of them and that we be very aware of them. Now I wanna get into kind of the more maybe traditional areas that we often think about, which is around direct stakeholders. I call them direct actors because sometimes stakeholders doesn't resonate as well, but end users, who's actually going to be specifically engaging with the system. Then we think about more broadly, and Arthi touched a lot on this, but I think it's incredibly important. Who are the indirect actors who are going to be impacted by the system? So it may be people who will be subject to the decision of a system whose job will be fundamentally changed by the use of a system. Um, people who be part of kind of their data is being collected to feed the system or train the system. Those are all potentially indirect actors who may have no idea even that the system is being used or how it works or you know, how it is influencing important core elements of their life. And so those are incredibly important to define these and think really broadly um, about these different areas and different elements. Now the kind of fifth dimension I wanna talk about is really vulnerable and marginalized populations. And so thinking about that, it's not that they are, they are simultaneously fulfilling one of these roles as an indirect actor or a direct actor, maybe even a tech builder or a sponsor, but they also have dimensions that make them more susceptible to potentially having disproportionate impact from the technology. And so it's important to consider what that is, um, what elements, who, you know, what kind of characteristics, what populations that may be. And those ones in particular, we wanna make sure that we're engaging on with and making sure that we're bringing their voice in as we're following this path towards building technology. And now the last element I wanna to touch on is this element around value systems. And so understanding that all of these different stakeholders we talked about, all of these different um, actors within the system have different value systems and different values that are important to them. And so what we wanna do is try and understand those. And also, again, coming from that point of view that we are not them. And so we need to learn this and understand this and consider this by asking and engaging with those populations so that we can understand. And so that when we design what we're doing is elevating those values, bringing those values to life and bringing those needs to life in a really tactical and tangible way within the system. So then the other dimensions that we think about when we think, start doing this analysis, so once we sort of like, that last slide is really about defining key important elements of the system that then when we do harvest modeling, we have clearly in mind and we can like have a really rich understanding as we define what areas may cause harm and what that looks like and for who and, and how it impacts their values in a negative way. Now the other dimensions that we need to touch on is around really kind of understanding fallibility of systems and understanding the different scenarios in which a system could cause harm. So one is sort of, I call unintended, but this is saying if the system does exactly what you planned for it to do, and the people within the system do exactly as you anticipated them doing, could it still cause unintentional harm? Are there still implications for people that you hadn't considered that could cause negative impact? Now, the second one is one of my favorites only because I love the beautifully, wildly diverse and different behaviors of humans. And so this one is really around, it's not that the users do the wrong thing. If they do something that we didn't anticipate when we designed the system, we didn't expect them to do it, then could this, what could the system do? How could the system react to that in a way that might be harmful? So we need to explore that and really consider that. Because I think we like to think we have this sort of beautifully golden path in mind, we have user journeys in mind, and we can do all these things, but we have to know like, people are very unpredictable and that's beautiful and it's fascinating. But 
if the system's not prepared for that, it can cause them harm. The third one um, is really around system error. So kind of having our own sort of humbleness and understanding that no system is infallible, no system is perfect 100% of the time. And so recognizing that there will be errors. And when there are errors, we have to consider what could happen, how could someone potentially be harmed when the system has an error, and who might that be, and what, what would that look like, so that we can then plan for it. And then the last one is really around malicious use. So these powerful tools that we're building to be positively transformational in the system, in the world, in the systems that we deploy them into, um, are also potentially attractive tools for people who have goals or intentions or malicious uses or things that we would not want. And so we have to think about that, like how might someone want to use this again in ways that we don't want them to, and then how might we prevent that? And so once we kind of have those lenses in place and have the system defined, then what we do in this, in this harms modeling is we actually go through and look across a variety of categories and are very specific about defining harm statements of saying, um, across these categories. So, may, for example, I might say risk of injury, and I might say it's a physical injury. So if in an in industrial safety setting, someone is counting on the system to alert them to a hazard or a safety issue, and it fails, then people on the factory floor may, floor may be injured. Those are the kinds of statements. This is the way we start to like draw this out with specificity. So then we can think about, okay, well, this, one of the answers to that is we need to make sure that there are people in the loop and that they're able and like prepared to jump in and help or, you know, help resolve that or double check the system so that there aren't unchecked safety hazards. So this is how we start to walk through. Really systematically, we start looking at risks of injury. We look at denial of consequential services, housing, employment, education, across the broad spectrum. We want to be as thorough as we can so that we are being really thoughtful again about the context and the, the broad spectrum about human well-being um, and ways that technology can impact that negatively. Then we think about infringement on human rights. So we think a lot about dignity loss, loss of liberty, privacy, uh, environmental impact, all of these like really fundamental foundational human rights um, that we want to be elevated and we understand that there can be times there's a possibility for things to be impacted. And so we want to be really thoughtful about exploring that. Like how might, you know, automation dehumanize people so that that kind of gets in the way or dehumanizes interactions between people because they're relying on a system and suddenly people are turned into numbers or data. And so we're very thoughtful about that and how we address that and how we resurface so that the humanity and make sure that people on both sides of the system know that there are humans on both sides and impacted. And then the fourth like larger category is really thinking about the erosion of social and democratic structures. So thinking about how these systems used at broad scale can cause manipulation, misinformation, potentially impact our understanding of like truth and reality and our you know, belief in what we see and hear. So that's the broad taxonomy that we use to explore these spaces. And then we don't wanna just leave it there, of course. We want to then be able to take that and say, now that we've explored this broad spectrum of potential ways of harm, we have the specificity that that may occur. Let's think about what are the tools we have at our disposal that we can apply. Is it looking at data collection and model training? Arthur talked a lot about that earlier, about collecting data from diverse populations towards fairness. Um, things like system architecture and AI tooling, how the user experiences the tool. Um, you know, operators as well as others who may kind of just walk up to the system. We want to be very clear and very conscious about how we communicate the system to, to them and how we have them interact with it. So that again, we're minimizing harm and we're elevating those positive outcomes. We also think a lot about deployment and user guidance. So especially with a lot of our tools, we put them in the world, um, you know, people take them and they use them and they build on them and we want to infuse them and share with well, we want to infuse that ecosystem with an understanding of ways to do this in an ethical and responsible way. And so we provide lots of guidance on how to do that. Um, and then there's also the element of who should have access to this. What are the appropriate uses? Um, who should be able to kind of engage with this technology? And then kind of one of the other areas is thinking about like public policy. Are there positions we should advocate for as a company based on our insights on how the, how the technology works? 
So these are just some examples. Um, I'm sure there are lots more and I'd love to hear what other people have tried, what you've experimented with. Um, but this kind of gives you a sense for how we think about this and how we move really towards framing and shaping technology through the insights we get from harms modeling. Okay. Okay. So what I want to do now is actually walk through a case study together. And so I'll say upfront that the case study that we're going to use is a real world case study from the New York Times. Um, it does involve domestic violence, but it doesn't get into strong depth about violence or depictions in that way. But I just want to give everyone a heads up um, on that. Um, and so a couple of years ago, the New York Times featured um, this article. And I think it probably it, it woke probably a lot of people up about you know, who've been sort of up, excited about automation and automation in the home and all these like interesting, um, you know, efficiencies we can drive and cool things that we can do. Um, and then what they ended up he starting to hear from people who were serving populations who were victims of domestic violence was that a lot of people were coming to them experiencing manipulation of these devices, not understanding how they work. And the service providers didn't know how they work either and didn't know how to help them take over control of the systems again. And so, um, so we have this case study. I'm going to walk this one through together. Um, and I'll walk you through kind of the flow about how we would do a pretty high level harms assessment on this. Um, and then I'm going to pre present you all with a case study. So I just want to prepare you all for that. So you'll jump in and do some shortly. Um, so if we take this example, of former domestic partners, former spouses, um, one partner who set the system up. Um, he's very familiar with it. He did all the passwords. He has all, all the apps he put in, you know, heating and cooling, lighting controls, you know, sound system, all of that stuff in, in the home. And he and his partner are now split. Um, and there was domestic violence, domestic abuse among the relationship. It's not a, it's a, it's a, you know, contentious split. Um, and the partner who's still in the home, Alaya, um, she's still in the home that they shared together, but she doesn't know how to actually control the systems. She doesn't know how they work. She doesn't have the apps on her phone. She doesn't know the passwords. And now she's experiencing things like her lights going on in the middle of the night, um, music going on, waking her up. She has like the heat and the, and the air conditioning is going to extremes at different times of the day. And so this is a scenario that we want to consider and so here's how we'd start to break it down. So we want to start with like, what's the value and the goal of this technology? What are the intended uses? Who's it for? And then start thinking about harms. And then we start thinking about mitigations. Cool. Okay. So the way that we'd start to break this one down is that we'd start with the uses and the values definition. Because we do want to always kind of keep in mind, like, what's the goal of this tech? What problems are that? What's the optimistic kind of benefits that we're aiming for? And so if we imagine, so we know why a lot of people adopt this tech. It's usually around, um, you know, using less power in the home, perhaps even environmental, you know, sustainability concerns or interests, um, saving money by not having things run when you don't want it to be running, uh, feeling more secure that you can check on your home when you're not there. Um, efficiencies of being able to let your guests come in and out or let people who need to work on home, just kind of being able to let them, let them in and not having to rush home to be there. So that's the positive path. And that's important again for us to keep in mind. Um, and then we start thinking about, well, who's that for? That's usually probably a homeowner or a renter or occupants. Maybe it helps you let your children, you know, in when they get home from school. If you're not there, you can just kind of lay out the code or you can just remotely let them in. Um, other guests or visitors from out of town, that sort of thing, right? Home repair providers. So those are some one set of stakeholders. That, those are kind of the core stakeholders that we're considering. And then what we want to think about is on the harm side. So I kind of touched on them a little bit in the case study, but the way that we start to think about this is to say, so potentially I mentioned sort of like lights on in the middle of the, of the night, disrupting sleep, heat and, and cooling disruptions in extremes that may disrupt sleep or just otherwise sort of harassing and terrorizing you, right? As a human in the home, not being able to control your systems. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So that's, those are the things we start to explore, right? To say like, okay, so these are different tools. These are the different things in the system. Um, this is how it could be used to harass remotely. 
And then we start to think about other things. Like if you have, if you have any of these tools that have a microphone or have a remote listening, could it be turned on when you're not like without someone knowing, could someone be sort of like surveilling your home and then use that for stalking or use that for harassment or good, get information that you thought was private within your home. We also think about um, potentially things like using a smart, smart speaker, right? Turn it the other way and being able to speak into the home, um, you know, have messages, et cetera, being able to harass remotely. So those are the core kind of harms areas that we came up with in this space. And now, um, then we start thinking about mitigations. And so we start thinking about things like, <coughs> how do we help people to inform and think about changes that may be necessary to protective orders and how protective orders are structured in terms of like remote harassment or technology like based harassment of kind of changing the boundaries or expanding the definition so it's not just physical space between people, but also the sort of technological reach outs. Then we think about things like, how would you how would you fulfill what people want from this technology in terms of security and things like that, but also give someone a way that they can kind of like reset it or take over control if they need to and make that easy and make it easy for people to also understand how to do that. Then we also think about things like how would someone know if it was being kind of activated remotely. How can we let people know that even you know care providers or service providers in your home may want some indication that something is watching them or recording them. We feel like that's important as well. So we think about things like that. And then we think about things like, um, specifically for this population, for the groups that are providing service and help for people who are experiencing domestic violence, how do we help train them on whatever it is we've implemented in the technology? So it's never just, let's fix the system. Sometimes it is a technology change, but it's also, how do we guide people to know how to use it, to know how to engage with it? So that's the high level about how we do this. And before I transition, I see lots of flashing. So I just want to check in with folks if there's questions or things I should be jumping around. And we have there, a bunch of anything. There was a good question from Lila um, Toplik in, in the chat if you wanted yeah. to take a look at that one. Sharon did a great job addressing that other question. Oh, but, okay. Uh, Would you yeah. mind reading it? Yeah, if I can get back there, my thing got weird. Okay. Um, yeah, actually, Lila, why don't you ask it and introduce yourself? Because you're kind of an awesome person, too. Okay, maybe she's doing so. I'll read it then until she comes back. She's a good person to know in this world, Lila Toplik. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. I was trying to unmute. Yeah, right. there you Hello. go. And show Hi, us Danielle. your Hi, Hi, honey. Um, thank you for this presentation. I was just thinking about a question that came up in some of the discussions we've been having regarding the data that might be coming from marginalized populations and wanted to get your perspective on this topic of building responsibly and how you think about fairness and harms vis-a-vis -vis the people whose data is being actually used to train mm -hmm. the models who might or may or may not be actually benefiting from the final solution. So what's our responsibility to them? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a big area actually that we talk about when we start exploring these systems and the harms modeling. One of the kind of core questions we ask as we, step, as we start kind of diving into this is where is the data coming from? Um, is it, you know, what populations are you collecting from? How are you doing that? Are you doing that in an ethical manner where people understand the, what they're being asked and what it's going to be used for? You know, are people being compensated if it's like a broad collection um, and treated fairly and again and being given like transparency and being able to really understand what it's being used for. Um, the other thing. So that's kind of like the rights of people we're collecting data from that we definitely dive into and talk a lot about The other element too is around the diverse voices. So one of the elements when we talk about data and collecting for fairness. Um, one of the ways that we use harms modeling is is through that stakeholder exercise. We really try and think broadly about um, you know, who, what are the characteristics or populations that may be impacted? Um, that's one of the ways that we highlight. These are the communities that we think we need to potentially collect more, you know, look at fairness for or, um, or co potentially collect data from. Um, so that's one of the ways that we kind of like help to explore and kind of define that space better. Any other ones jumping out? 
Nope, that's good. We can dive into the uh, hands-on portion. You're doing awesome. Awesome. Okay. So hopefully everyone, and Danielle did, did everybody get the file? I'm hoping people got the PDF of this. Um, we'll send it out to Harmony. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so he's going to get this, Josh will get this out to you all. I'll walk through it first. And then what I'm going to do is hand it over to everybody, give everyone a little bit of time to do some solo working. Um, and then we're going to share back because I would love to hear kind of your insights as you kind of walk through the same pattern of what I just presented. So we're going to do a new, new case study. Um, this case study is really about a large corporation comes to you as a tech builder and says, um, hey, we want to build this, we want to have some tool that will help us um, monitor employee morale and well-being. And we really want to like help empower our managers and help empower our HR, our, our HR to understand like how um, they can address, you know, how everyone is actually doing and how, might, how we might kind of have interventions and help with kind of driving more wellness among our employees. And so the way that they propose doing this is using computer vision um, and kind of analyzing uh, expression and, and using basically the camera in your laptop or the camera in your conference room um, to do facial analysis and skeletal tracking and kind of try and have an analysis around emotions and posture and what that says about um, uh, your, you know, your body language, et cetera, what that says about your well-being in the workplace. And then being able to take that, use that for insights for um, interventions potentially or help or, you know, nudges or engaging with, with um, your employees. Now, one of the engineers and your team says, hey, uh, I have doubts on the accuracy of emotion detection, because what, what does that mean exactly? Um, and I'm not sure that I would feel comfortable uh, with this with this kind of thing happening to me if I were an employee. Um, so this is the thing, right? So I'm feeling like this feels a little bit like surveillance. And so what we want to do is kind of take those perspectives as our starting point, take this case study as your starting point. Um, and what we want to do is actually go through that, do the activity kind of like I just outlined before. So start by thinking, you know, putting your own lens, put your own thoughts on defining the value of the technology. So sort of saying, okay, how might this be positive? What may be some good applications? How could this be beneficial? Um, thinking about who the variety of stakeholders and, and different characteristics within, right? Think about within the manager population as a category, but then there's lots of different variation within a manager population or employees, right? There's a broad spectrum of characteristics and attributes that are really important to consider within employees. Then on the second part, you can start thinking about harms. So how might this be negative for people and for whom and what does that look like? Um, and then start brainstorming on recommended mitigations. Um, what are the ways, you know, are the technology, are there ways to shape this technology to make it better? Are there ways to understand it better? Um, to convey and reassure employees, etc. So I'm gonna give everyone Unless anyone has any questions on the activity, I'd love to give everyone about, let's see, we'll do like 15 minutes for just some like thinking engagement time. And then I would love for us all to come together and have people share out in chat. I'll try and read through that. Um, the moderators or, or people can come off mute. I guess the crowd is not prohibitively large, so people can actually come off mute and we can share your insights on the different sections. So to be clear, everybody in the chat, there is a PDF document called Anticipating Human Impacts. You should click on that, open it, and spend the next dozen minutes or so reading it, thinking through. And if you have questions while it's happening, you can use the chat or come off mute, and then we'll come back as a group, and Harmony will guide us through this interactive hands-on harms modeling so you can start to learn to use these skills yourself. Awesome. Okay, so. Uh, let me bring the case study back up. Okay. So I'd love, so if people can, uh, I'd love, if people want to, let's go, there's a hand raising feature in Zoom, I don't think. So um, if you have, 
something you'd like to share, if you can drop it in the chat and then I will call on folks and then I'd love for, I'll help unmute you. Um, and I'd love for you to share your perspectives directly. I want to stop screen sharing actually so I can see humans. So some people need a little bit more time. Oh, I'm okay. So um, why don't we, for if you're ready, start getting active and sharing your thoughts. Um, raise your hand or just flag and Harmony can unmute you. And if you need a little more time, please go ahead and take as much time as you need. This is this is a dense material yeah. and it's important to really, um, yeah, absorb it. Katrina, would you like? Oh, okay. Katrina, would you like to share your thoughts? I see some really good stuff there. It looks like Katrina is still on. Okay. There we go. Yay. Hey, everyone. Hi. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty scary scenario that you painted. And it totally reminds me of the panopticon where you're always being watched. So I mean, I, I kind of don't even really want to salvage this in terms of how to mitigate um, some of the harms. But um, I suppose on the good side, what the company is trying to do is tr sort of figure out um, how people are responding, um, if they have ergonomic uh, work situations, and, and maybe for the intention of bringing more resources to support people. So that could be the good side of things. But you, it doesn't take much to imagine all of the harms of watching people, the anxiety of always being watched, of always being on, um, of penalizing people for how they react, um, mm -hmm. their facial expressions and so forth. So I just, I don't see a lot of good in this technology. Sure, sure. You sounds like you're thinking a lot about from the employee perspective in this case, right? Being under that spotlight all the time, being analyzed, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. Right. Understand those reactions. Um, I'd love some others. What were some of the other ones? Uh looks like. Uh, Layla, would you like to share some of your thoughts? Absolutely happy to. I was also equally scared of this type of technology. Um, although it made me wonder now that we're all working remotely, whether actually that could be helpful for um, many people who are just getting adjusted to working remotely. So I think there's this question of consent and who actually gets to see that data and where that data goes. So a couple of arms that I thought about uh, specific to the biometric aspect of the of the data that's being collected. One is reliability of biometric based identification, mm -hmm. just in terms of skin color, gender, age group, um, facial recognition on ethnic and um, uh, or uh, facial expressions on et uh, different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. How do we codify uh, whether somebody is stressed or not stressed um, if they're coming from different uh, parts of the world and have a different way of expressing emotions. Uh, mm -hmm. Privacy, I've seen that with also biometric uh, uh, data too and biometric databases is that di databases could be hacked and biometric data could be stolen and uh, correlated with other data that's out there about us. Mm -hmm. um, obviously concerns about the abuse of biometric data, whether it's infringement on the rights and values through surveillance or reuse without consent uh, because we don't know if this company will be bought by somebody else or the government will request that data and what will happen with it. Yeah, yeah, lots of great thoughts about what happens to that data and whether we can even be, whether you can even be accurate enough to make it like fair or about, even if you wanted to do that sort of thing, right? Could it even be accurate or fair? And then you're right, I always, that's always a big one when I talk to teams is like, once you have, if you are creating this, stockpile of really valuable data, it's going to be valuable to other people too who may want to act right and like thinking of being super thoughtful about whether you even want to capture it or sort of collect it. Yeah, those are all really great points. Who else is looking at the... Oh yeah, it looks like Pippa had a similar um, thought that you did around, and Pippa, please jump in too, around the differences in how people express themselves um, and 
whether that would whether it's even possible to understand their inner state. I bet you want to say a little more about that. Oh yeah, no, I think um, Lila captured it beautifully. I just was going to say people do express themselves in different ways, and is facial recognition really going to solve this problem? Um, I think the use case should be uh, reconsidered. Actually, um, is this a problem to be solved uh, by AI machine learning? How are we solving this problem today? What is what is the, the technology going to add? Um, and if we don't know how to successfully solve it today, we can't just turn it into an AI problem and it'll magically be solved. So AI is not the solution to everything. It's a, a, a magic tool, uh, but we have to know how to train the AI to make it useful. So I think we should be how are we using this tool for this at all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's always a huge element, right? It's the that concept of, yeah, is AI even appropriate for this? Is technology even appropriate for this? And is this even like, should you even go down that path? Absolutely, that's a huge question. Uh, looks like Eleni, do you want to share? I'm kind of looking down there. Hi. 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 So I, I said what I needed to say in the in the comments, okay. but one thing that comes to mind, um, so my background is in philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to be a philosophy professor. And when I think about how we do applied ethics, in addition to the rubric of concerns that you'd be tracking, we also have a series of case studies that you can go back to, to see when people saw these kinds of cases in the past, how do they decide? Mm -hmm. um, so instead of sort of brainstorming from scratch each time, we, we go back. And I, and I wonder, is there a similar practice of having um, a case-based um, way of, of, of looking at things where you look at, look at past precedent to de determine, mm -hmm. sort of to track the kinds of concerns that come up over and over and over again, or is that being developed? Has it been developed? If I were, to, if I were working in your field, could I look at cases like this in the past and start with a roster of concerns that have been um, foreseen already? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and it just occurs to me, you say philosophy, we have a philosophy professor ethicist on our team and he's always, you probably studied a lot about the panopticon and all of those concepts before. So anyway, um, yeah, so that, that makes me think of two things. Um, one is um, in terms of precedence for, uh, like when we say, when someone, when a product team comes to us or we start working with the product team and they're like, hey, this would be really cool if we applied AI to this thing and be really innovative. We really start with, how is this task being done now? How is it being accomplished with humans, with current tools, with whatever's happening? So what can we learn from that, right? What were the implications of that? How does it work? What's not working well about that? And, and is the thing that's not working about that something you can apply AI to? Is AI even good at that? Um, do we understand the limitations of what AI is even very good at? The kind of, I'd say, meta point about reflecting on past things and other sort of examples, um, one of the things that I'm doing as I've been running this harms modeling practice within the company is to say, for this type of tech, here's the kinds of harms we've identified and here's the kinds of tools we've applied for that. And what do we learn from that? And so that next time someone comes and says, well, I'm using, I wanna use computer vision for this kind of scenario. I can say, okay, so when we did it over here, this is what we found as a harm. Let's validate that's true for you. And then let's figure out how we might, like here's the techniques that worked really well over here. Let's try and apply them. Or here's these techniques that I saw that, you know, Google did or some other, you know, other folks in the industry have done to make this more ethical and like how we can, that's a lot of what our team does is like just kind of gathering as much pattern and testing and feedback so that we can feed it into the process for sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I lost track of the scroll here. There's folks up there. Who else? Is anyone else? I'd love to hear. It's like mostly worry. Let's see. There's Eleni. Nalini, do you want to share your inputs? Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I sort of second a lot of the comments that are coming in uh, the chat right now. Uh, you know, emotions are uh, subjective, they're based on context, culture, upbringing. Um, there's so much nuance to how we express ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I worry that uh, it's not just about representing it in the data set, but even just understanding and, and creating the right, uh, you know, thresholds or what have you to determine what counts as something that needs to be taken an action on, right? What counts mm -hmm. as being productive? What counts as being, yes, I need to alert this person now or uh, engage with this person in a different way. So there, there's just 
the scope of harm is huge uh, as I see it here. Um, even if we were to assume good intent uh, from the company that they do really want to encourage general well-being, um, you know, sort of saying that we're going to monitor you 24 by 7 or whenever it is that you're online, uh, and that's how we can enable general well-being at scale um, is fundamentally flawed. Right? So, so that's where I feel like tying uh, general well-being to productivity and then uh, using a system like this to, to track uh, and monitor uh, either of those is problematic. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, and one of the things, I, I'm not to influence the crowd, but one of the things that um, sometimes we do come to that place of is saying, if we know that um, emotion detection is not effective, it's a, it's a proxy for proxy and you can't know someone's internal state based upon external expressions, no matter what you think. Um, sometimes those are the kinds of things that we have to kind of, we bring our insights and our learning and research and bring that to the product teams and say, hey, I understand what you're trying to achieve here, but that's you're not actually going to achieve it with this and you're going to cause more harm. So how do we try and get to what you're really trying to do? And like, what's the method we could help if, if well-being is the goal, you've decided emotion and maybe detection is a proxy for that. But let's think about really like, what are more real, realistic indicators of well-being if there are any that we could successfully, safely detect and then provide guidance on. So, so yeah, those are really great points. Sometimes those are interesting conversations. And, and like you said, well-meaning humans who are trying to do something helpful, but sometimes you have to have those honest, frank conversations. Yeah, and I also think that, uh, you know, one thing that a lot of these systems, especially facial recognition, emotion detection, or gait recognition, they tend to miss uh, that humans are uh, you know, sort of just grow into having a visceral sense of their environment, uh, a visceral sense of uh, the people around them. Uh, you can't automate that. You can't sort of represent that in an AI. And, and that's something that a lot of these systems tend to ignore when they're uh, getting designed and, and that's problematic too. Absolutely. No, that's an excellent point for sure. Yeah, it's all those inherent innate things that are so human that you can't just replicate with a system. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, checking time. So. Does, had, did anyone come up with any ideas for how you might um, guide, pivot, change this uh, system, this case, this scenario, um, kind of understanding that the end goal is employee of like wellness? Um, did anybody have any interesting ideas on how you might do that, how you might approach that? Let me scroll down and see if anybody has anything done here. Building trust is a, yep, opt in. That's a great point, Pippa. Yeah, self reporting. Oh, yes, those are so good. These are great ideas. Yes, yes, yes. Um, opt out by default, no penalty for opt out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, this, so I'll, I, I think we're about five minutes towards the end of this session. Um, so, so yeah, those are the kinds of things, if we were presented with the same scenario like this, that's the kind of thing that we start to do is we start to say, okay, if your goal really is employee wellness, um, does, the, does the company need to be able to see this data? Does management even need to see this data? Or is there something that you, could you pivot it and do it in a way that allows someone to opt in and allows it so it's just a tool for that employee that they're allowed to engage with that they're allowed to give signal on and shape and give feedback about and decide what's helpful for them or not helpful for them like those are the start the ways that we start to try and engage with product teams on rethinking and sometimes even reframing how they think about the problem yeah so i love these yeah all of these things about making it a personal tool for employees exactly like those are the kinds of ways you can start to um, that we try to influence or try to sort of shift sometimes the thinking about how we're thinking about these products. Um, so any, any last questions or thoughts? Um, and then, so I want to preview that, and I, I'm happy to give you guys a couple minutes of a break too, because I know we're, it's like, for those who've been on most of the day, it's a long day. Um, even two hours is a long. So, um, so essentially what we're going to do in the next session is kind of building on this initial phase and you all have done such a great job 
um, I'll present a new case study. And then what we'll end up doing um, is I'm going to break you out into Zoom breakouts and have you actually work through this motion together. So you can actually kind of collaborate and bounce ideas off each other and work through these pro through this new challenge set. Um, and then we can come back together and have a discussion again. So I think this is really kind of helpful just to like get some reps with the process, um, engage with it, get your feedback, etc. So any questions before I give, I think I might do, we could do like a five minute and then jump back in. Do you want to, so you want to let them know how we'll be, they'll be just automatically put into breakout rooms? Well, um, yeah, once, so we'll reconvene together. I'll pre present the case study and then we'll automatically push you all into breakout rooms. My awesome team will help moderate the rooms. Um, so you can ask bounce questions off of them as well. Um, and your peers, which I think will be really fun. So. Okay, so we'll set the timer for five minutes, take a little break, and then we'll come Thank back you. here and uh, Harmony will tee up the next section and then you get to go in little breakout rooms with a facilitator from our team to really kind of dig in and really learn how to do this yourself. We're teaching you to fish. That's right. Okay. See you in five minutes, everybody. Okay. Welcome back, welcome back. So, as we mentioned before the break, what we're going to do is I'm going to present another case study and then we're going to have some fun in breakout rooms. Um, so you all can engage with each other, bounce ideas, like have a little more time to like deeply think about how might you address this or what are the areas that you want to like think about what are the areas you'd want to explore more? What are the spaces, you know, what are the stakeholders you'd want to understand better potentially in this scenario if you were working down this path of trying to build it? effectively and build it responsibly. Okay. So this next session, share please, thank you. Um, yeah, so really the goal here again, like we wanna build reps, we wanna get you comfortable with it, we wanna give you time to practice it so that hopefully you can take it back and use it with your in your own practice with building technology and your own work. Um, give us feedback, share what you learn. Like we're sharing it because we want other people to use it and benefit if they can. Um, but we also want people to try it and give us feedback and tell us what they discovered by using it or how they, you know, what new ways they decided to approach um, technology. So we would love, love to hear back from folks. Okay, so this new case study is Health Chat. So a healthcare company has been experimenting with ways to use technology to improve public health through education and personalized guidance. So one of the initiatives that they've had in place for a while is they have this really popular weekly podcast hosted by a really well-known physician um, who shares her expertise, answers questions, um, and she's been really successful in helping the, like, the outreach team, helping to reach new populations, helping to reach communities, um, and been really successful in connecting people to guidance and resources to help elevate their own, you know, empower them to control their own wellness or know how to get resources when they need help. So the outreach team thought, great, let's think about how we can expand this and like continue to like reach out and engage with more populations. So what if we made an interactive digital assistant? And what if, um, let's work with an app developer and let's say one of them would be great if we can like carry that personality, carry that connection um, from the physician who hosts this really popular podcast. So Dr. Lopez, let's have her voice be one that people can engage with when they're calling in or they're engaging with this bot um, or this digital agent. Because that way they'll kind of be able to carry that connection and feel that sort of real personal, um, you know, human element when they're engaging. It doesn't feel like a digital agent. We, the, the theory is people will be more likely to follow that guidance that they get from this agent. And then they thought, okay, so what if we also want to have this, this tool that can engage with children? And so what if, in this case, we, um, you know, we're able to use the voice of a popular cartoon character. Again, having something familiar that people can interact with, that children can engage with, um, that gives them guidance and recommendations on ways that they can be healthy and have healthy habits and practices in a way that's appropriate for children. 
Um, so that's the goal. That's what that's the big idea of the outreach team. And I think this would be a great way to elevate community health. So um, a member of the outreach team, when they're talking this through with the developer, does express concerns about recognizable voices being used in the case. Like, what if there are errors in the guidance that are being generated by the AI agent? And what if people recognize that, like, associate that with Dr. Lopez and what that impacts her reputation? Um, also, wondering, like, do, are people going to really understand that they're interacting with the digital agent? And how might they feel about that? What would they want to know? So, that's the case before you. And we're now going to. First of all, any questions before we dive in? Hopefully you all got the new file. Did that get dropped? Just toggling. Did we, oh yeah, great, that's the new file. Okay, so if everyone can download the file, and then we'll also share it into the breakout rooms. We'll go ahead and drop into the breakout rooms. And I'm gonna give, let's do 20, 20 minutes and then I'll have the moderators let me know how things are going. But I wanna give you guys the chance to really like engage with this deeply, really again, like think about how you might approach this. What are the different ways than either data or code or experience that you might be able to do this? Okay, so welcome back everybody that was a little abrupt but that's okay we were all like i know my group was like in mid like thought <laughs> so um as soon as we have harmony back she can kind of like land the plane and um we'll all sort of like come together and share things out but um i'm sorry that was an abrupt transition <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you had yeah I'm glad okay. you're having vibrant conversations. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Poor Didi was like in mid sentence. So oh, um, I hate that. I've had that with these breakout rooms. This is always the awkward thing. Even if you see a countdown, sometimes you don't see it or it's like you're mid. I've, I've had that. It's so awkward. All right. So, Harmony, you take us okay. home. Okay. Yes. So, welcome back, everyone. Um, so, I would, um, I know I was in a breakout room um, and we had, we also had really vibrant conversations. And I'm just so excited to hear what people came up with. Um, and so let's start with, uh, I don't know if you, do you guys know what group you were in? If not, we can do it. We can start with group Rachel, group Rachel one. Was guiding, oh Rachel. yeah, Rachel. Guiding group one. Yeah. Guiding. Rachel, can you, anybody from your group want to share? What yeah, we have some awesome people in our group. I think we have you guys uh, from the group, Angela, Didi, Eleni want to kind of speak to what we were chatting about. It was really interesting. Um, I can jump in too if we have weird mute issues. Some of the areas. Anybody from that group? Is it Angela and Dee Dee? Mm -hmm. People should be able to unmute themselves. Yeah, I think Dr. Dee Dee is unmuted. Do you want to share? Sure. More than happy to. Um, so we, we brought up a couple of uh, points that um, the technology, the use of uh, speech to text uh, um, or creating a chat box for um, uh, an introductory uh, medical information service or something that seems like it's going to be providing um, really generalized information such as WebMD or what people will jump on Google to try to find out seems a little heavy handed. Um, mm -hmm. And in the event that it is created, some of the negative implications would be that it's not take, thinking inclusively of um, people with uh, chronic illnesses, for example, they already have um, uh, systems set up where they manage their illnesses uh, properly and they would need to have a direct connection to their physician rather than having generalized information. Um, it's also not taking into consideration that um, uh, different communities, uh, different um, ethnic groups, for examples, or cultures, they don't necessarily work on an individual uh, me to physician um, process. Um, it's more of a, a group environment. And then also thinking um, about the implications of the tech itself, um, it may not recognize different types of voices 
if that's how the information is being inputted to provide um, resources. And it, um, it brings up um, ethical questions or concerns around voice recognition if the voices are actually being replicated from other people um, or real people. Um, it it uh, creates um, uh, an ethical um, dilemma where that person could be identified, that person's identity could be stolen, um, and so on and so forth. And I can't remember a couple of the other points, but no, these are all happy really to let great, someone else jump in. Really great issues you guys touched on. Yeah, elements of um, yeah, does it even work? If, if the interface is voice, does it work for a variety of populations, different vocal tones, qualities, mm -hmm. accents, all of those things like super important, right? Like the last thing you want to have is to have a system misunderstand someone, give them wrong guidance based on a misunderstanding or have someone trying right. to talk about something and it's like, I don't know what you said, mm -hmm. right? Like that's miserable, especially in a, if you imagine sort of the, if you're in a health if you either have a health problem or you're uncertain and want guidance, like in that state, right? The mindset of the people who are going through that, you want to be particular. I think the threshold is even higher, right? Like that's what right. I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Like, oh, and then, and then like, also the, the, the weight of whose voices are going to be used in uh, creating the chat bots um, that are providing information. Is it going to be a diverse group of people or is it going to be the de facto, what we assume um, um, a, a, a doctor sounds like, which is white and upper class and male, um, that, that also brings in some, some implications uh, culturally and um, uh, that could cause a lot of problems. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's absolutely true. Um, <clears throat> and like, yeah, who's represented in the voice and, and if it's a real person, what if it's gonna be, like, if it's a real physician, and it's giving bad guidance, how does that impact that person's <laughs> reputation, right? And like, and you're right, if the whole goal of using a real human to create this voice bot that's realistic that people connect with is, if um, uh, if the whole goal of that was to help people connect with it, but it doesn't feel like it's representative of them, if it sounds like that sort of like elite, you know, Ivy League white male, then it's probably not gonna like make people more likely to follow guidance or connect mm -hmm. with it. No, those are amazing points. Um, I love that element too of thinking about, you know, not all cultures have that individual relationship with the physician and how would you think about that and understand that better. Um, I feel like all of those, if you were even going to say like, let's try and do this in a way that's effective, all of those populations would be important to have research and engage with and like really understand in a much richer way what their needs are and what's useful and all of that. Yeah, no, I love that so many. Do you have any other ideas on parameters or how you might approach it or any other thoughts you all came up with? There was one interesting point that I wanted to bring up yeah. that, um, as a parameter that we talked about was it seemed from the prompt that there was a lot of assumptions around the um, already the people who would be using it while excluding quite a large amount of populations. Mm. So in terms of like stakeholders that um, should be taken more into account and talking about various, um, you know, people with varying access to the technology, um, maybe those who, maybe people who are mute and can't speak, or maybe people who are more naturally soft-spoken um, that would have troubles, um, various accents and things uh, like that to take into account, as well as the um, systems that are already set up that um, it's like, well, what's the difference? Should we create a more robust package of this kind of thing. Yeah, no, those are great, great thoughts, great elements. Um, uh, Catherine, were you in room number two? I was in room number I'll two. Hear what you all, some folks from your group, see what they thought. Yeah, so I, I have some notes. Um, so just in general, um, there was some trust issues. So, um, you know, before, we made a move to a lot of telehealth. There was, you know, the trust and the need for in-person visits. So having a rapport with the physician, so that may impact whether or not people want to call in to a doctor they've maybe never met in person and whether or not that would affect how, a, you know, the trust of you actually believing the diagnosis that would come out um, mm -hmm. of the other end. Um, when we talked about stakeholders, um, Dr. Lopez did come up. Um, and I asked if, you know, it was a good thing or bad thing. Um, and Ali's response was depends on the quality. And so you could think that, you know, if the AI was really, really good, that everyone's going to be like, oh, we don't need to go see Dr. Lopez in person. 
and no one sees her and her practice shuts down. But on the flip side, uh, if, um, if you, um, if the AI does really, really poorly, everyone's like, oh, Dr. Lopez is a terrible physician. Even though it's an AI, they're still going to scrub the voice and then her practice still fails. And mm -hmm. so what, what is the stake that um, Dr. Lopez has? We also talked about um, the children. And so you kind of have the, um, I think it was Josh talked about like Joe Campbell and you think about the cartoons um, in the, in the eighties and nineties and, you know, selling children on, um, yeah. you know, terrible things like cigarettes. Um, but a great point from Ali was that, you know, if you have a diagnosis coming from one of your favorite cartoon characters and it's, you know, traumatic and scary that this cartoon character is telling you that you're ill, every time you see that cartoon character now on TV, it's going to be scary because you're like oh no that's the thing that told me about the terrible thing and it's like is that really the the news that you want to hear from your beloved yeah. cartoon character so interesting discussion about stakeholders um when we talked about harms um always the scams for money and data um, maybe if you see an increase in the number of calls about diabetes info for a particular neighborhood that gets sold to insurance companies mm -hmm. um you know apps are always talking to each other uh, what data is being used to actually return the results so that gets to training um, and what are the actual data that you're pulling from um, the hackers um, always going back to hackers sure. um, but for them for the mitigations you know talking about some sort of anonymity so you're not actually saying hi I am patient number x mm -hmm. accessing you know my you know group health plan or whatever um also making it very clear at the beginning that this is not the real dr lopez so having some sort of upfront disclosure um really working up front with the designers and the engineers to work on the like who's included in the building process and everything um and talking about how you collect the data and what cases you include the scope of it so we had a little bit of discussion about maybe you start small so maybe you start with just like COVID and then maybe like later on you move to just flu season and then maybe you move to just hay fever season and then from there you can scope out um, and at the end Ali was sort of saying like you know how could if you think about WebMD how could WebMD go wrong and then you can extrapolate that to, to this sort of scenario so we had some great discussions um, Ali and Josh if I miss anything feel free to jump in um, but I think we we had a, um, a good a good time so yeah, that sounds like really robust discussion. You got some, some really good mitigations. Mm -hmm. really Anything other folks from that group wanna add? Okay, I'm just checking my list here. Uh, Josie, were you on group three? Any folks from your group who wanna share your insights? Yes, I um I couldn't remember what group I was, what number we were. So thank you, Hamley. That was yeah, uh, we had a really, really great conversation. We had uh, Katrina, Chavi, Layla, Pippa, and Mariana in our team, our team, in our breakout room. Um, and we talked about like quite a huge, you know, range of things. Um, going from you know talking about the transparency of when this technology would be used and is that clear to the person using it through to the consent of the person whose voice is being used. And also Katrina made a really interesting point about, well, is it a voice that has been synthetically generated or is it a voice that has been generated from a human who exists in the world? Um, you know, and what are the different ethical issues we need to think about um, with those two categories of How voice? Did you, did you guys dig into those of saying, like, did you come out on one side or the other versus like, uh, like, mm. I don't know if we came out on one side or the other. Um, Katrina, do you have anything you'd like to add? It was such a fascinating point because Katrina um, is involved in podcasting. And so Katrina's oh. voice is, you know, out in the world. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And we also yeah. talked about that. Sorry, um, I guess to just to kind of build on what Josie was saying, um, I, I think that there is a difference when you take the, you know, like, let's say someone took my data, my voice as a data set and then generated something mm -hmm. specifically from that to sound like me versus an actual you know synthetic voice um so if the person who is consenting to that you know the the broadcaster that's one thing but if it's just out there um you know what are uh the responsibilities and rules around that we did talk a bit about biometric data and there were some other people in our group who made some really good points around regulation and compliance and there are laws around this mm -hmm. yeah no i love that i love to have your perspective on this if you if we shift briefly, I want to tap into it since we have you. Um, uh, 
if we think about sort of your your domain of expertise and where you podcast about, um, would you imagine like is there any scenario you imagine where if some if the, we created a not we me, me but if someone created with your consent a synthetic version of your voice that sounded just like you and could generate answers to something or responses around your area that you didn't necessarily control, how do you think we've thought about that in terms of like? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it, it gives me pause for for concern. Um, it's one thing for, you know, a person to dispense advice. And it's another thing for your voice to be used as a data set. And how how is that advice being crafted? Would I have said that is something that is, would I have any, you know, agree with that. And then there's no ability um, to kind of redress that issue, like once it's out there and your voice is on it, it, it might as well be you. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there, you know, I think there's some problems with that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I just, I love to ask the question because I'm super interested. I think that's like the emerging issues with synthetic media that does sound realistic, like there's benefits to it. And then there's all of these issues, right? Of saying like, yeah. well, if you didn't, if you don't specifically type and tell the voice what to say, then it could represent you in a way that you didn't intend yeah right. i love this any other big ones you'd like to share josie or other folks from that team this is great i love hearing these insights we also had an interesting conversation about whether this is the right tech to solve this problem and mm -hmm. Layla in our breakout space um talked about an example where she worked on a chatbot with some young people and they actually didn't really like using a speech function they wanted to just do everything via text so even just having that speech function wouldn't work for them for example um, so you know is it the right tech to solve the problem and we also talked about deep fakes as well and and I think this has been covered by other groups too but you know that idea of like liability if something is shared in error or um, something you shared that's inaccurate and there's that person's voice attached to it. What does that mean? And again, we talked about compliance too. So yeah, yeah. And is there anything else that anyone from the from the group would like to add into that? All right, awesome. Oh, I love this. This is one of my favorite things. I love to hear the different, like one of the reasons why I love running these models with product teams is I like to like prompt these really deep thinking about complex issues. And it's even more fun with a group of amazing humans who are already like thinking about ethics and really deeply in this space. So this is so much fun. Um, Sharon, I think you were leading group or engaged in moderating group four. I was, and I'm gonna happily pass the potato to <laughs> Alyssa, Claire, and Nalini, because I think you guys all brought up really awesome points. And just we had such diverse backgrounds, some from products, some like different countries, different continents. So I just want to bring it all in. Um, so if one of you guys want to speak to some interesting things you felt like were brought up. Okay. All right. yeah. uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I won't remember everything that was said, um, but we talked a little bit about how uh, this app might impact um, health providers um, in general, especially the public ones. So, for example, if the app was in general quite cautious and recommended people go and see their physician, um, then it might actually involve um, an uptick in, in the use of medical services and the use mm. of, of those resources. Um, and that could have serious impact nationally. Um, and we also, I think one of the things I like best about our discussion with Sharon posed the very interesting question of, um, if the app was really, 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 really accurate, would we still have a problem with the human voice? Or is it really just like about the fact that um, there are uh, false positives and false negatives may, may impact it in different ways? And one of the things we discussed was um, people might believe that it was human and might believe their conversations were therefore covered by doctor-patient confidentiality when they weren't. Uh, and that could be really misleading, uh, even if the app was completely accurate in terms of diagnostics. Mm, but I don't yeah. know, Alyssa and Alani, I don't remember some of the other stuff we talked about. Yeah, I think, I mean, it was uh, lots of different topics covered, so you're right, I may, I may not remember all of them, but um, one of the things that stuck out for me was, uh, you know, the conversation we had around uh, over-reliance on something like this mm -hmm. and how the harms um, exponentially increase as you rely more and more on something like that. So if it gets it right, uh, you know, for an entire year, and then at the most critical time it gets it wrong, 
uh, is that harm bigger than if it gets it right like the first or, or third time that you use it? And how do you quantify sure. things no, like that? No, that's a really great point. Yeah, it's like like building the trust. The more, if it's accurate for a period of time, it may even build a false trust, even if you try and warn people. Um, but then down the road, when it gets it wrong that one time, that could be incredibly impactful. That's a great thought, great insights. Yeah. Yeah. Especially as over time. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, no, sorry, Clay. <laughs> Isn't it? Especially as over time, like medical knowledge might change and people might not know how up to date the app is kept. Sure. Okay. Yeah, no, that's another great. No, 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 that's good. That's a great insight as well. Um, did, I'm, I'm curious, did any of you consider um, kind of splitting the scenario, consider um, sort of proactive wellness tips versus kind of um, react if someone is coming because they have a question or concern. Did you think any differently between those two or similar? Yeah, we actually did. Um, Claire was giving an example where, uh, you know, receiving information uh, in a timely manner sometimes is helpful, especially for situations where uh, you know, you're dealing with uh, something like a pregnancy, for example, uh, mm. you know, sort of uh, timely information is useful, you can sort of uh, change things around and make it better for yourself because of that. But shifting from there to actually solving a health issue uh, mm. through a chat is a whole different context of uh, the harms, right? So mm -hmm. considering those two situations differently and saying maybe, well, it's okay if it's just giving me information, but if I'm going to actually actively engage with it to solve a problem, then that's, uh, then that's different and probably more harmful. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's really interesting thinking. Um, this is good. Oh, I love this so much. Um, so I want to make sure we touch, so we have one more, uh, breakout room five had Sangi and I, as well as Susanna. So I'd love to tap Susanna because she had some really great thoughts um, and insights. Susanna, are you still here? I think it was more along the lines of trust because you know, if, if the chatbot was you know, made into an avatar or a virtual representation of my own doctor, then whatever advice it's giving out, I'm going to hide, it's going to give me an additional layer of trust because it's coming in the voice of my own doctor, then I'm going to assume it is accurate as well as it's trustworthy. And then on the other hand, uh, if it is, uh, if it is even if it's, I'm, I'm just using it to, uh, you know, ask details about an allergy or something very simple, and then it is giving me some advice based on Wikipedia or whatever WebMD and then says, you know, drink some tea, drink some ginger tea or something. I know that advice is not from my doctor because my doctor would know the specific allergies I have to some things and then he may not be giving out that information. But then this chatbot might, might be trying to tell me something in his own voice, which is which is going to contradict everything <laughs> and then uh, and then on the other hand if it is personalized then what kind of data is being given out to this chatbot that will go against the hipaa guidelines of this state and even any other guidelines in medical privacy uh, and then we talked about i mean i didn't i didn't see a good use for it in any in any scenario um the only one scenario where i saw a potential use case could be reminders, medical reminders to take your medicine or to, you know, come for your doctor's appointment. If it, that comes in my own personal doctor's uh, voice or avatar or anything related to him, then that's like very, very personalized and it has some bigger impact on me, like my own doctor calling me or, you know, telling me to do this. That is the only use case I see for this, uh, uh, you know, Avatar, uh, avatar or virtual assistant in my own doctor's or, you know, image or voice or likeness. But in every other case, I don't see a good use for it because it builds an additional layer of trust, which, which is not a good thing. You know, it could give out wrong information. It could be misleading me and it, and anything that comes in there, in their voice or anything would be, uh, you know, detrimental to our health. The other uh, area that I was like talking about is that, is this an area where we actually need to be working on the technology 
I mean, instead of focusing on the scalability of accessing doctors, why not focus on making their job easier? If we actually make automate all their paperwork, all of the other junk that they are doing all the time, then they will have more time to talk to me. Then I don't have to automate this part. So the focus of technology should be on automating things that are non-essential, that, you know, that don't need the human element. Wherever the human element is needed, don't automate that. Don't try and put your uh, thinking in your brain cells into automating something that is, should be remain human always. Yes, I love that point so much when you brought that up. That's the foundational, right? It's like, should we even do this? And is this even the area to automate? I love that. Thank you. Any other, any last inputs, any last thoughts from folks? This is a really great discussion. Um, I hope everybody found it really valuable. Uh, Danielle added a link. So um, in addition to the PDFs that hopefully you all have, um, we also published like a little, a more depth kind of guide to using this harms modeling technique on, um, on our external Azure Docs sites. Um, and so Danielle added the link to that on here. So hopefully people can use it. I would love to hear back from folks. Um, I am on, Basecamp, or I will be on Basecamp. So if people have questions or if people want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm always, I really want to hear feedback from people. Um, I'd love for people to engage with the technique and let us know what you find. Danielle, any closing thoughts on your side? No, just a huge thank you to everyone who hung in there. This was a really dynamic, amazing experience. It was kind of an experiment and um, you all did great and it's the beginning of an ongoing dialogue and relationship so please stay in contact with us we want to hear from you what happens when you take this practice back to your teams we are at the where we have as much to learn from you guys as we you know vice versa so please take this make it your own and let us know how it goes and let's keep the dialogue going yeah now i wonder is mia gonna take us back i think so it's there, Mia, you're on mute. Hi there. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you all so much. I just wanted to um, thank everybody for their time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are so grateful again, um, Josh, Alexa, for making this happen, Danielle, Harmony, for bringing this all together and for everybody who joined because again it's been a long day you all hung in there but i'm sure it was worth the effort um and uh all the time that went into this i do want to thank our volunteers as well who are still hanging in there after 12 hours and uh, ray and maya who've been here since seven in the morning. So we'll call it a night. I just want to say we will be sending out a quick survey and it's just two minutes of your time. Please let us know what you thought of the sessions. It just, this was our first annual event. Uh, we can only get better, right? So if you can just share your feedback, just fill out the quick survey, it's on its way to you right now. Uh, we'd be so grateful. Thank you so much. And uh, that was Thank you. All right, take care all. Bye. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.